All right. So hello, everybody. Greetings and welcome to the Knowledge Graph Embeddings tutorial at ECI 2020. Thanks for, uh, for coming up. Uh, we always obviously wished we, we were all in person in Santiago, but these are the times we're living, so we're going to have to go for the virtual um, uh, experience. Now, um, you may have joined other sessions th this week, so you may be familiar with the, uh, with the kind of... Uh, I think you cannot hear me, which is bizarre. Um, let me just, okay, you can, uh, everything is, seems to be working fine. So I would, uh, I, I was about to say, we have a packed schedule today. So, uh, but uh, first thing first, I would like to introduce my colleagues. So from Accenture Labs Dublin, so uh, Sumit, hello. You're on mute, Sumit. Nick, hello. Adriana, hello. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Hi. Very good. Uh, now, uh, today we're going to walk you through the, um, the world of knowledge graph embeddings. We have quite a lot of topics to, to discuss, right? But before we get started, I would like to point out a couple of things. Now, if you, uh, I posted this on the on the chat as well, but if you guys need to go full screen, right click on the on the stream content on the slides, and then click on show controls, and then double click on the slides again, and it'll it'll pop up, um, it'll show up at in, in full screen mode, so you can you can see uh, what's going on a little bit clearer. Um, other than that, if you have uh, questions, feel free to uh, type them in the chat. We'll be happy to take your questions in the QA session at the end of the theoretical overview section. And we'll, 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 we'll cherry pick um, some of them and we'll discuss them together when I'm over with the theoretical background. Now, um, just a few words on the, on the outline, right? We have we have quite a lot of uh, ground to cover. Uh, we're gonna start with the theoretical overview, and we're gonna see like uh, how knowledge graph embeddings um, work in practice, what they are, evaluation protocols, and then we're gonna talk about uh, advanced topics and open research questions. And that would be with myself for about one hour and a half. The last. 15 minutes will 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 have a will be a Q and A session, right? So that you guys can 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 ask questions. Then we're gonna move to a list of applicative examples with Sumit and Nick, and then Adriana will will showcase the the software ecosystem around around knowledge graph embeddings. And at the end of the tutorial, we have a very interesting hands-on session with a live collab. Uh, where, um, notebook and Sumit and, and Nick will uh, showcase the use of one of the libraries that implement knowledge graph embeddings and they will show you around on how to work with that. We're gonna share the, the link uh, later on. All slides will be shared in the tutorial on the website, right? And so you could uh, double check, um, you, you, you could look up the content and, and uh, uh, go through uh, the slides uh, later later on as well. All right, so let me let me kick off. Let's let's start to take a look at the uh, theoretical background behind behind all the graph embeddings, and let's let's start with the um, with, with with a quick introduction. Right, we need we need a bit of um, shared jargon to to get started. And first of all, we need to define what a what a knowledge graph is, right? Now, um, some of the some of you guys in the audience may have uh, already a familiarity with the word of of knowledge graph embeddings, right? And what what knowledge graphs are? Um, they, they're they're graph. Uh, it's it's a graph based data representation modality, 
where we have binary relations and labeled edges, right? Besides, we have directed edges. You see these, these arrows, they're very important because relations in knowledge graphs have a subject and an and object. For example, we have Mike born in Liverpool, right? And, and the direction of the edge is, is important for the semantic of the semantics of the, of the predicate. Now, um, something interesting to point out is that knowledge graphs uh, can have multiple relation types. So multiple nodes like Mike and Liverpool can be connected with edges labeled with different, different um, um, semantics, right? So this is, this is quite peculiar. And we, we point out that the set of entities of the graph, the set of uh, nodes, which we also call entities, is called E, and the set of relations uh, all the type of different um, labels assigned associated to edges is called the set of relations. Now, I, I, I recommend to look up uh, this piece of literature if you're interested in, in more details. Now, having said so, knowledge graphs are, are, quite, are quite interesting for a number of applicative use cases, um, branching from, from social network to web-based collaborative knowledge bases like uh, DBpedia or in healthcare when trying to model protein to protein interaction networks and genetic information. So there's a wealth of knowledge graphs uh, adopted in literature. And there's a wealth of knowledge graphs available online. Um, they, they can be like domain specific or, or general purpose, like the ones that I um, show up in, in this slide, something like Yago, Wikidata, or DBpedia. These are knowledge graphs which are uh, automatically generated in, in, in some cases from, from text, uh, like uh, from mining web pages like GDELT, or um, they are the result of crowdsourced uh, operations like Wikidata, or a mixture of the, of the two, like Wikipedia is a machine readable version of Wikipedia, but it, it's, it's also the result of automatic um, construction procedures, right? And I would like to point out, point out the size of these graphs. Um, these are old figures, they're, they're probably bigger than, than this. Um, this slide is, is a bit old. But we're talking about billions and billions of statements and millions and millions of, of, of nodes, right? So we are really talking about enormous graphs, enormous um, knowledge graphs. And, and the problem is that these graphs can be, uh, they are the result of automatic uh, generation and crowdsourcing. So, Keep in mind, they may have uh, missing edges, or uh, um, they may not include all the all, all the facts. But they they not they may not be entirely comprehensive, right? And this is important. Uh, it's it's quite it, it's something to remember because that means that means knowledge graphs operate under this regime, which is known as the open world assumption, right? Right. What what, what is the open world assumption? And um, it's it's an assumption, right, where it says that if a fact is not in the knowledge graph, it's not necessarily false, right? We simply don't know whether it's false or not. Now, like in the example here, we, we know that Acme Inc. is the workplace of George. This is a true fact. But do we know if Acme Inc. is based in Liverpool, right? Do we know that? We don't. That doesn't necessarily mean that the absence of a fact means that that fact is false in this context. There are contexts where this is, this is what happens, not in, in knowledge graphs. Now, this is, this is important to remember, as you'll see later on. Now, um, when talking about machine learning on knowledge graphs, you may, you may ask yourself, well, why, why, should, why should we care, right? Why, why is that important? And, and so I, I'd like to introduce the the family of um, models that belong to the so-called area of statistical relational learning. This is the keyword to remember. Relational means 
uh, that deals with relations between between data points. It, it has nothing to do with re relational databases, right? And so it's it's a term used in a different context here. And so applying machine learning techniques to graphs is quite useful. As you've seen, these are enormous graphs that has a lot of buried information in them. And so we can think about tasks like predicting links or a similar task called triple classification, which is used to complete a graph or to recommend content or for question answering, right? This is the first class citizen of, of tasks that we carry out with, with machine learning on, on graphs. But you could also think about um, something called collective node classification or uh, another similar task called link-based clustering, uh, where, for example, we try to assign a, a label to, to, to nodes, right, according to their topology and structure of the graph and other, and other uh, properties. This is useful for customer segmentation, for, for example. Or we could think about other tasks like matching entities. Um, for example, if you have Alec Guinness, right, the, the actor, and Arthur Guinness, the founder of the, the beer Guinness, right? And then we get a entity called A dot Guinness. Well, is this A dot Guinness Arthur or Alec? And by looking at the topology of the graph, by, by processing the graph, we can, we can uh, associate and merge A dot Guinness with Alec Guinness, right? This is a task called entity matching, right? So a number of things can be done with, with uh, machine learning on graphs. And as I said, link prediction uh, and triple classifications are the two most popular tasks that can be carried out, right? And in, in fairness, we'll, uh, we'll, focus, uh, we'll focus mostly on, on link prediction in, in this tutorial, right? Uh, which is, again, the, the task of assigning a score to, to a triple, to a fact, such that the higher the score, the higher the chances that that fact is true, right? Now, um, this, as, you've, as you'll see later on, is cast as a learning to run problem, but there is a similar task, which is a binary classification task called triple classification that um, is used to decide, again, in a binary classification setting, whether a, a link is a missing link is true or false, right? Now, um, before starting, uh, before dealing, uh, de uh, starting our deep dive in knowledge graph embeddings, I'd like to point out that the the, the realm of uh, the area of statistical relational learning is quite an established field that goes back. Uh, to the early uh, notice, and there there have been a number of techniques proposed in in, in the past few years that um, are radically, if you want, different from from what you're gonna see in this tutorial. Techniques that range from logic programming. Again, all this stuff has been uh, proposed to predict new links from facts, right? But the the rationale, the design rationale, and the techniques used differ quite a lot from what you're going to see today. Um, but it's 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 important to know that these methods exist. Uh, methods like in inductive logic programming uh, or rule mining techniques, like the popular uh, MEA plus uh, that extract chord clauses uh, from from knowledge graphs, or all the world of graphical models. Um, Conditional random fields, um, relational Markov networks, and the likes. Now, the the problem with these techniques is mostly that they're limited in scalability. And when it comes to knowledge graphs, uh, we we need methods that scale a bit better, given the size of of the graphs uh, that we are we're processing. And some of them also have limited modeling power compared to, to what is feasible with knowledge graph embeddings. And, and as I said, they, they, they're non-differentiable. So you, we, we cannot use modern, for example, modern GPU architectures um, with, with um, stochastic gradient descent based uh, learning, right? So uh, that means that in 
I would say around um, 10 years ago, we started uh, considering uh, the, the paradigm um, of representation learning for, for graphs as well. And this is lately, it has been called um, in, the, in the past couple of years, graph representation learning, right? Which is again, an area where we apply machine learning on graphs, but we, we sort of avoid extracting features manually, right? Because that is really hard and time consuming on graphs. And so instead of hand designing features, like following a classic machine learning approach, right? Where we have our graph as input and we hand design features and then we try to learn some weights from those features and come up with an output with some downstream task instead of doing so, what if we apply the representation learning paradigm, which is learning features, learning representations of nodes and edges automatically, right? And this is what graph representation learning does. And, and it, it, could, it could be carried out, it's a task that could be carried out uh, in, a, in a number of ways, right? Using a number of uh, tools, right? We, we could use um, existing, uh, popular and mainstream architectures like convolutional neural networks or uh, RNNs, right? But the problem is that these architectures have been designed mostly if you want for grids in the case of CNNs or for sequences in case of RNNs. And, and we sort of claim that graphs are definitely more complex than that. There is, first of all, no notion of spatial locality. There is no fixed node ordering. Um, if you're familiar with the graph isomorphism problem, uh, that is, um, it can be like uh, 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 one, of, one of those critical aspects to consider when designing an architecture. And, and then a graph can be multimodal. There could be like nodes representing concepts. There can be text, numbers, timestamps, and so on, right? So we need, we need specific models, models which are tailored to graphs, which are tailored to this, to this uh, data modality, right? And, and which is why we, we, we work with graph representation learning, which is why the community came up with graph representation learning, which is, which is a, it's, it's an area that includes a number of methods, models, that learn representations of nodes and edges, right? So get starting from a training graph, right? This is supervised learning, by the way, right? We, we sort of turn, we turn nodes into vector representations, right? And we, we, turn, we turn as well relation types into their vector counterparts. And this is done so that with these learned weights, these learned embeddings, we can carry out a downstream task, which can be predicting a link, classify a node, and, and so on, right? And, and we leverage the power of learned representations because we kind of know how to handle vectors much better than the nodes and edges, right? Because vectors can be processed with neural architectures, they can be processed by uh, by GPU um, units. And, and it's a well-established uh, paradigm of, of uh, modeling information and processing information, right? So uh, that means graph representation learning is, is obviously quite a broad area of research. And there are a lot of families of, of models. Um, you may have heard about not representation learning, for example, or also known as methods based on graph feature uh, extraction, uh, like the path ranking algorithm, deep walk, and so on. Or you may have heard about uh, graph neural networks, which are neural architectures quite similar to knowledge graph embeddings, right? They are, if you want, a deeper version of, of the architectures that I will present uh, in the tutorial today. So this is out of the scope of the tutorial. We, we will focus instead on knowledge graph embeddings, KGE in short. 
and we'll, we're going to see like how these models work in, in practice, right? If you guys are interested in, 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 in these two families, I would suggest to look up these two references and they, they'll give you a good overview of what, uh, what the state of the art is, right? So knowledge graph embeddings are then models that by leveraging supervised learning, learn embeddings, vector representations of nodes and, edge, and edges, right? And, and they do so by, by learning these projections in a continuous low dimensional space. These vectors, they have usually no more than a few hundred um, uh, components, right? So they're quite um, memory savvy, and which is, which is a good property. And we, we therefore start from a, from a graph made of nodes and edges, and, and we move to a vector space where each point represents a concept, and, and, and the position in the space of, of each point is semantically meaningful. It means that as it happens in, in word embeddings, similar concepts are show up in similar portions of the, of the embedding space, which is a property that we'll, we'll leverage later on for downstream task, tasks, right? Now, um, there is quite a lot of literature out there and it, it ranges from a first model proposed in, in uh, 2011, right? And there are models which are proposed literally every, every couple of months, there is an interesting paper in, in the area. I, I try to um, make a, a bit of a digest here. We, we're not gonna cover all these models. And as I said, this slide is leaving out a lot of them, but um, you'll, see, you'll see in a moment what is the rationale behind behind this tutorial? We'll we'll try to give you a good sense of what types, what families of KGE models um, uh, there are out there, without uh, going into uh, fine grain detail on on each of them. Right now, um, something to remember is that all all these competing models they they all try to achieve the same goal, if you want, which is learning a meaningful set of embeddings, where meaningful means that these embeddings must be positioned in, 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 a, in a way such that we, we maximize the chances of predicting uh, a test set of missing links. So we, we want to make sure that our, our learned model, our embeddings can be as effective as possible to predict unseen missing missing links in a in a graph and and that and that happens if the model is expressive enough right and with with expressive i mean the model must be able to capture a lot of knowledge graph soft properties if you want for example the fact that facts may be symmetric like in this case or they may not like Alice is a child of Jack, there may be in, in there, there, there may be a lot of inverse relations, like Alice child of Jack, but Jack father of Alice. This is called inversion. Quite, um, it, it happens quite often in, in knowledge graphs, or there, they may be like composite relations. For example, if I um, know that Alice is child of Jack and Jack is sibling of Mary. It means that Mary is the aunt of, of Alice, right? So a good model is must be able to capture all these properties, but it's not all. It's not all about those four guys up there. There are also hierarchies, uh, type constraints, uh, transitive uh, relations. Um, there's quite a lot of homophily. It means that similar concepts sort of, right? sort of stick together in, in terms of topology. And there are long range dependencies between concepts that, that must also be, be captured, right? So a good, a good knowledge graph uh, embedding model is, is indeed able to, to model all those properties as, as best as it can. 
And this is a, a table that I grabbed from, from the, this paper here, Rotate. It's one of the latest proposing literature. And, and see, when, when, when reading literature on knowledge graph embeddings, it's all about a bit of an arms race to whoever is best at uh, capturing all these properties and doing so by keeping uh, a good trade-off between expressivity and and uh, scalability and, and time it takes to train the model, right? So this is why I will now go into a bit of uh, extra details in, in the anatomy of the of, of our knowledge graph embedding model. We'll, we will dissect together a KGE model and we'll, we'll see how, how its components interact and work together. Now, what you see on the screen here is a um, block diagram that describes a generic knowledge graph embedding model. Now, on the left-hand side, we have a training graph, right? A training knowledge graph, which is obviously way, way bigger than, than this toy example. Then we have uh, um, the architecture of the model, which is made up, it's made up of um, a couple of layers. We are not really talking about um, extremely deep neural architectures. The, their their uh, structure is relatively simple. We have a couple of layers. What is called lookup layer, very simple. We, we, it simply assigns an embedding to each node and edge type of the graph. And it simply looks that up, right, from from a um, from a um, set. That's what the lookup layer does. And then we have a scoring layer that interacts with our loss function. This is the, the core of the KGE model. We'll have we'll talk about how negatives are generated, and then everything is optimized to train embeddings, right, which are then used at inference time by the scoring function, the same scoring function that you have here, right? To predict new links, for example, right? Which is the downstream task that we will consider in the, in the tutorial now. Now, having said that, this is the bird eye view of how a uh, knowledge graph embedding works. We will now dissect the, the, the architecture and we will describe every component one by one starting with the scoring function, right? So the, the so-called scoring layer. Now, the scoring function, I said before, it's, it's a, is at the heart of a knowledge graph embedding model. It's, it's an equation, right, that assigns a score, a differentiable equation, uh, that assigns a score to a triple, SPO, subject, predicate, object, right? This is a fact, for example, George works for ACME, right? George is the subject, works for predicate, and ACME is the object. Now, the, the role of the uh, scoring function f is to assign a high score to, to facts which are likely to be true, and low scores to facts, triples, that are likely to, to be false, that are likely to be negatives. And this can be done in really dozens of different ways, and the literature is really wild on, on all the different ways that, that this can be achieved. As I said, we will not cover everything because it will take uh, probably a couple of days of uh, webcast time, but we will, we will focus on the most, um, if you want, uh, important models and most used models in, in practice. We will describe these models in, uh, and we will divide these models in families. And I will start with a family called transla translation based scoring functions. Just keep in mind that most of the papers, most of the works uh, published in, in this area, they sort of differ mostly uh, from, the, from the kind of scoring function, from, from the kind of intuition that they, they, they implement. Well, it's a bit more complex than that, but bear with me uh, for a moment. Now, I would like to try to start describing what uh, translation-based scoring function do. 
And I will start with this model, which is one of the most popular, as I said, it's called translating embeddings and was proposed a few years ago in 2013. It's one of the earliest knowledge graph embedding models. Now this model assigns uh, a score to, to a triple using this equation, but uh, if you want, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a intuitive explanation of how it works. So if we have the embedding of the subject S, for example, this can be George, right? And the embedding of the subject S is this vector here. And then we have the embedding of say, the property P here, right? If we, if this is, if this is literally R P, imagine to translate this vector that I just drew here, right? So that you can sum it up with the vector of the subject and you end up in a position in the, in the space which should be quite close to the embedding of the object E O, right? So in a nutshell, the translating embedding function assigns measures, measures the distance between the sum of the embedding of the subject and the predicate and the embedding of the object. The closest this distance here, the, the highest the chances that the, the triple is true. Right, it's like saying George George plus works for should pretty much end up being close to Acme Inc. If it does, probably George works for Acme is is correct. Now this is pretty much the intuition around translating embeddings, right? And and this was uh, and it, and it still is a very popular model used in practice. Also very simple to 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 explain, right? But there are other mo other models based on similar intuitions. For example, there's a, there's a very recent model which is also based on um, translation, tra translations in, 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 a, in a metric space. It's called Rotate. Uh, it's pretty much similar to, to translating embeddings, right? Uh, but instead of, instead of a, trans a translation, uh, it's, it's about a rotation in the space, right? So the, the relation, the, the embedding of the of the predicate right is interpreted as a as a rotation in the space so um this is done this is done again to to capture to better capture all those uh, properties um symmetry anti-symmetry um composition and so on that i that i described earlier on now all this is done in the complex space right um just Keep that aside for a moment. I will explain that in a in a, in a minute. Uh, so all these vectors are made of uh, a real uh, and a imaginary part. So uh, it means that rotate takes um, uh, an extra toll on memory consumption. But this is just to show you what are the possibilities, right? When it comes to defining a scoring function based on um, translations and or rotations or other operations between vectors in a, in, a, in a geometric space, right? But then there are other methods which uh, are based on uh, tensor factorization techniques, right? Uh, one of the earliest is definitely Rascal that carries out a, a low rank factorization with, with, with tensor product, right? And this was one of the early, early works that uh, bootstrap the, uh, community of knowledge graph embeddings. Um, this one is also very, very, very popular. It's called Dismult. It's a bilinear diagonal model. Uh, it, it, again, it's a, it's a, it's based on a factorization approach, and it decomposes um, the problem using using a dot product, right? Um, a three-way dot product between relation uh, predicate, uh, sorry, relation embeddings embeddings of subjects and embeddings of objects, right? And this proved to be a quite neat idea and quite effective, but the problem with this model is that this, this dot product is symmetric and therefore this mode sort of doesn't really capture very well uh, asymmetric uh, re relations, right? 
uh, which are quite popular in knowledge graphs, and which is why the authors of this paper, Complex, which is um, probably still at the forefront of the, of the state of the art, right, despite having been proposed a few years ago. This, this model here is an extension of this mult that operates in, in the complex space. So instead of a dot product with, um, real, with embeddings made of real numbers, it's a dot product made of um, between, between uh, embeddings with a real and an imaginary part. And this happens because the dot product in C, the Hermitian dot product, is not uh, symmetric, and so the, the the model complex is is better at capturing asymmetries as well in the, in the data. Right now, this is as I said, still a very 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 popular model used across the board uh, and in 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 applicative scenarios together with with translating embeddings, for example. Right. Uh, but there are families of models which, um, if you want, adopt a different different rational, different strategies. Well, I call them deeper scoring functions because deeper from a, an architectural point of view. There is there is another popular model called uh, convolutional embeddings, ConV, and um, that that uses reshaping and, and convolution to uh, score a triple. Right, so. It's like without going into into the, the the details of the equation, we have a linear convolution operator that um, operates uh, between the embeddings of the subject and the predicate and and a filter. Right? Uh, they introduce uh, a weight for a linear uh, oper uh, combination as well. Um, so there, there can be other uh, param train parameters during during the training procedure, which are not the, the embeddings. And by by mixing, reshaping, and, and convolutions, they sort of come up with a scoring function, which is, as you can see, way deeper than than uh, the methods I presented before in terms of uh, architecture to implement. And there are like some variants on the on the theme. There are uh, one 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 of them being ComKB, right? Uh, which is again uh, a variant of of convolutional embeddings. The problem with these methods is that they are uh, really more computationally expensive to train. They don't scale as well as uh, the the methods that I presented before. And if you want, they resemble. This is not entirely correct, but um, if you want, they, they resemble a bit more to uh, graph neural networks, even though uh, convolutions, if present in, in graph neural networks, are uh, in, in, in a different part of the architecture and the rational is different. But these are models that uh, they do scale, but they are really order of magnitudes slower than, than the ones that I uh, presented before. You're going to see that. During the hands-on session with 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 Sumit and Nick uh, later on, as I said, there are lots of other models presented in literature recently, right? Um, like holographic embeddings, uh, simple quaternion embeddings, MERP, but there are many more that I that I haven't put on the slide, and um, it's it's important to remember that they, despite seeing new papers coming in, uh, as I said before, every couple of months. There's no shortage of, of academic venues to publish, as you guys uh, as you guys know. It's important to, to spend time benchmarking these models and figuring out if it's worth adopting new 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 papers or whether it's it's rather better to stick to, to existing models. You, you'll see later on what I what I mean by that. But keep in mind that the take home message of, of this of this slide is that keep in mind there are lots of different ways to design a scoring function. Some scoring functions determine a model that scales better than, than others. And, and, and scoring functions must be designed to capture all sort of properties in the in the in the knowledge graph, ranging from uh, symmetry, asymmetry, and so on, right? 
Now, having described the scoring function, I would like to spend a few words on another very important components of the of a um, knowledge graph embedding architecture, which is which is the loss function, right? So, again, there are just like for for scoring functions, there are quite a few losses that can be used in this in this context. I will start by giving you uh, an overview of one of the earliest losses used in, in this area. It's also quite intuitive to understand. It's called, it, it's a hinge loss. It's called pairwise margin-based uh, uh, loss. And it's it's what it's minimized by the optimizer, right? And it's, if you want, it, it includes the, the score assigned to uh, positive and negative triples by the scoring function f that we we described earlier on, right? This is where f goes during training, right? So in a nutshell, this this function here it makes me pay a penalty if the score associated to a true triple is smaller than the score associated to to a negative by a margin gamma. This is a hyperparameter, right? So in a nutshell, I want I want the model to, to be able to tell positives from negatives, right? By assigning a score to, to a positive, which is at least gamma different from the score associated to a negative, just to, to, to guarantee that the model is able to tell false facts from true facts, right? And and this, this what I've just described in plain English is implemented in, 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 in this equation here, right? Minimizing this equation aims at doing what I just what I just said. And and we go we go over uh, this is um, this is the, the, the entire loss um, that that is implemented in the training loop. And in the training loop we literally go over all the triples in the in the knowledge graph, right? T plus G is the training graph, and for each triple, we also iterate over a number of synthetic negatives. I haven't I haven't said a word yet on on negatives, but I will I will get there in a in a couple of minutes. So that means that for each positive, we will also process negatives, which are required in the loss here, right? Just keep that aside. We'll we'll get to synthetic negatives in in a moment. So this is the rationale of the pairwise margin-based loss. But as I said, there are other losses. We 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 see quite a lot of use of uh, negative log likelihood or cross entropy. So um, where we uh, it, it's something that we've seen uh, in in literature more and more often. Again, without going into much details, we we have seen uh, variants on on the theme. Um, for example, the convolutional embeddings uh, model (conv) uses something called binary cross entropy, which is again a variant of um, the, uh, the NLL loss that I presented earlier on. Other models like rotate introduce introduced uh, a, a loss which is based on a, it's a it's based on a margin uh, based approach but uh, they call it they call it self adversarial loss it it includes uh, a weight associated to to the negative example sample from the pool of synthetic negatives right so there are again without Looking at the details, if you're interested in the fine print, I'll recommend to read to read the papers. Um, the the take-home message here is that papers in in literature present this um, besides besides presenting scoring functions, they they also they also present uh, new losses, new loss function functions, and in most of the cases, the interplay between uh, novel losses and and scoring functions is what determines the um, uh, well behavior of 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 the model, right? Uh, okay, so uh, as I said, many more 
uh, many more uh, losses are are uh, are available on, uh, in, in literature. Again, I, I invite to to look up uh, recent surveys and papers on 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 the topic. Now, uh, speaking on losses, it is also quite important to remember that there are a lot of um, different ways to um, add regularizations using classic uh, L1 or L2 or uh, L3, as proposed uh, by by this paper that introduces a model called complex N3, which is, to the best of my knowledge, probably still the best uh, the best um, uh, the, the model that, that that is topping the leaderboard as we speak. Um, other architectures use dropout, for example, Conv, right? So again, it's all about how uh, how we we play around by mixing and matching scoring functions, loss functions, regularizers, initializers as well. Um, these embeddings must be initialized somehow, and we can use different different strategies. We usually go for a Xavier uh, optimizer, right? Um, but it's all about how we mix and match the components that um, I described here in the in the architecture, right? Most of the papers are rehashed versions of of other um, uh, papers that replaces perhaps the the optimizer or the loss function or the scoring layer with something else, right? So it's all about how you come up uh, with, with original combinations of, of these of these components, right? Now, um, I have introduced negatives generation earlier on, right? I, I, I said a couple of words uh, about the presence of negative examples, but what are what are these negative examples? Where, where do they come from, right? Now, uh, first of all, uh, a note on terminology. When I talk about negative examples, I also call them synthetic negatives or false facts. These are facts that are not, but are not true, right? And and this is a bit of a problem in this community because um, because knowledge graphs are uh, they work under the remember I showed I showed you that a few minutes ago under the open world assumption. So it means that if you process uh, something like DBpedia, which is a machine readable version of Wikipedia, you will not have false facts in it, right? You 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 have facts like. Paris is capital of France, but you will not have a fact such as France is not capital of Germany, right? So, so it means that uh, on the other hand, the the knowledge base may may be missing a fact. Uh, so there probably may not be a fact called France capital of um, um, France has capital Paris. Perhaps it's it's not in there. But it doesn't mean it's a negative, right? It's just a missing fact. So to overcome that problem, because in 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 if if the, if the ultimate goal of our models is being able to tell true facts from false facts, we need to train them with false facts, right? They false false statements, negatives are are required for a successful training. So that means that we we do a bit of a hack. Right in, in in this community, what is done is that we we leverage something called the local closed world assumption, right? So we sort of say, all right, let's try to generate some negatives. Let's try to make up some false facts. But let's try to do so with a with a grain of salt, right? Let's assume the knowledge graph is only locally complete, right? It means that locally, looking just uh, uh, at a single triple, for example, we can presume that corrupted versions of, of such fact, of such triple, can be considered negatives, right? So we define this set C uh, that stands for corruptions, right? Which is the set of all the, <clears throat> of all the corruptions, of all the altered versions of a, of a fact SPO. And um, when I use the hat here is to um, identify a subject or an object which has been um, replaced 
that replaces the original subject or object with something else, right? So it's important to, to point out that we, when generating corruptions under the local closed word assumption, we always try to corrupt either the subject or the object, only one of the two, right? And we never touch the predicate. The predicate is always unaltered. Right. This is one of the things which are easier to see than uh, with one example than, than explaining. So if we presume a set of entities, E, made of Mike Liverpool, Acme George, and Liverpool Football Club, and two relation types, born in and friend with, and then we take the triple, Mike born in Liverpool, how can we corrupt this triple? We either change the, the object, like in these two cases here, right? We kept Mike born in Aziz and we replaced the, the object with uh, some of the other entities in the entity pool, right? Or we replace we replace the, the subject, right? Like we did here and here. Now, these are synthetic negatives. Some synthetic negatives may make more sense than other, right? Like this one is, is a good negative, George born in Liverpool, right? Makes sense, right? Semantically speaking. Uh, Acme Inc. born in Liverpool does not. And also, I've never heard of anybody being born in a football club. So this one is also a bit meaningless from a semantics point of view, but it is a, it is a false fact, right? So again, this is a quite straightforward way of generating negatives. Uh, it may lead to, if you want, meaningless negatives, not very informative, but not, not, not very good negatives if you want from a semantic point of view. But, uh, and it may even, it may even lead to, to false negatives because sometimes we, we come up with, with negatives which, which are, um, which happen, happen to be, to be true and we don't know that. But it has been shown in, in, uh, showed in, in, in experiments across us over the years that uh, this is a quite quite an effective technique, and especially uh, keep in mind that we generate lots of lots of negatives during training, and it it it's performing quite quite well, right? But nothing will prevent you from replacing this with a more clever with a cleverer technique. Just keep in mind this such technique will have to to scale, right? Because what we need to do here is something quite quick, so that training time won't be affected too much, right? So. Once we defined what the trainings, um, what, what, what the negative examples are, we have to decide a way to, to use them in practice and during training. And in literature, there are different techniques, um, one being uh, uniform sampling. That means that we generate all possible uh, synthetic negatives, right? And then we, we sample, we sample uh, those, those negatives for each uh, for each positive, we, we we just take a few a few uh, negatives for each positive, and we go ahead with, with training, right? Other other papers, um, I, I think the complex entry paper does that. They don't sample; they just they use them all. They generate all possible synthetic negatives for each positive, and then they train the model with that. Just a, a word of warning: this may affect your scalability if you are processing an enormous graph and you have millions and millions of distinct nodes, you will end up generating millions and millions of negatives for every sample in your training set. So it may or may not scale. It really depends a bit on the, on the use case, right? And well, um, it's not over because there are different, different scoring techniques as well. And for example, the, uh, the convolutional embedding uh, paper uses a technique uh, called uh, one and scoring, right? Uh, so they sort of split their their triples in uh, in batches, right? Um, and then they batches of where they replace either the subject or the object, and then they they label they label those batches um, as positives if they're included, included in the training set or as negatives if they're not, right? So these are different techniques, but it's, it's, um, it's important to remember that uh, this, this um, using synthetic negatives in training 
during training can be done in different ways. And it's also important to keep that in mind because at the end of the day, it's one of the both aspects which are important when, when uh, comparing different models, right? Uh, performance wise. And it's also one of the things which are peculiar for, uh, of, of knowledge graph embeddings. This is, this is something that doesn't happen in, in, in traditional machine learning settings. Where where you usually you're usually given um, positive and negatives, whereas here uh, it's a bit different. You 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 get to, um, to 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 play around only with positives, and you have to make up to to have to, you have to make up negatives, right? Now, uh, having said that, having said that, um, a few words on the on on how the the loss function is optimized, right? So we we need an optimizer, obviously. Uh, as I said before, we're we're talking about um, uh, neural architectures, which are differentiable, and so well, we we use backpropagation, we use stochastic gradient descent, right? And and the goal is minimize the loss function such that we can learn optimal parameters, optimal weights, which happen to be the embeddings, right? So. So the train weights of of, uh, of that, that are included in the in the loss function, the train variables are the, the embeddings, right? So when we train the model, we are learning uh, how to uh, position those those vectors in the embedding space, right? We we fine tune the the embedding vectors as we go in an iterative fashion, and um, and we. And we use off-the-shelf variants of stochastic gradient descent. We could use stochastic gradient descent, why not? But best results are usually obtained with uh, ADAM or ADAGRAD, right? And it's also important to, to remember that um, some of the works in literature uh, do this, uh, they, they sort of apply what we call injection of reciprocal triples in the training set it means that they take a positive triple and they revert sub subject and object right and they add a reciprocal relation and then they proceed by training the model on that this is something to keep in mind it's important to remember uh, and to point out if if a, if our uh, paper work applies that technique because um, this is one of the if you want controversial aspects that will uh, when when comparing when comparing uh, the performance of different models right so it, it's important to remember whether a model does or does not that or or it's important to play around with with libraries that lets you enable or disable this um, this um, function right this option now, um, speaking of training, it's um, one one last important one last important thing is that uh, you should you should really keep in mind that uh, as for all the other um, machine learning uh, uh, areas of adoption and and different architectures and different tasks, hyperparameter tuning, model selection is very important. Um, knowledge graph embeddings are no exception, right? You will see this later on in the hands-on session. You will see with Sumit uh, how to how to fine tune um, the hyperparameter tuning. But keep in mind that usually we rely on on good old grid search. Sometimes the size of the grid is, is small. Sometimes it's big. Um, there can be early early stopping or not, right? But it's it's important again to, to keep in mind the size of the grid because these experiments, sorry, these these um, training campaigns, these model selection campaigns may take quite a lot of time because the training procedure and the evaluation procedure is such that it may be a bit time consuming. So keep keep this in mind. Keep in mind as well the as usual the values that you assign to hyperparameters. Again, you're gonna see that we we'll zoom it later on in the hands-on session. Um, we have seen using random search uh, quite a lot recently, and some papers use um, a combination of um, Bayesian optimization and, and random search for model for model selection, right? But 
really, uh, I would I would say that ninety nine percent of of works are done by sticking to to grid search, and with relatively small uh, grids, right? Now, I think I have I, I just given you a pretty comprehensive overview of how KG models uh, look like, right, under the hood. But I would like to to spend a few words on describing how we evaluate such models, how we measure their success, right? So this is a crucial uh, part to to understand. It's it's quite it's quite important, and and I would like to to start by um, showing the task, right? The so link link prediction uh, is is as I said the first class citizen. This is the same slide that I presented earlier on. I introduced triple classification, but um, I like to stick to link prediction uh, from now on, right? Uh, so let's not talk about binary classification. Let's talk about the the problem of assigning a score proportional to the likelihood that uh, um, novel triple is true or false by casting it to a learning to rank problem, right? So what does it mean? It means that we're going to see how well each positive triple in a, in a test set um, ranks against some synthetic negatives. Again, you, you you find the synthetic negatives again. It's the same. We, we're gonna use same pro the same procedure that we use during training to generate them, and and then we'll 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 sort of use metrics which uh, come from the world of information retrieval, um, ranking metrics. So mean rank, mean reciprocal rank, which is the, the mean of, uh, it, it's exactly like mean rank. It's instead of having the mean of the rank, we 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 invert the rank. Uh, we, we take the reciprocal of the rank because uh, this is to guarantee a bit of a um, uh, robustness against outliers, right? So that if there is a, an outlier here, it will have a big effect on the mean, whereas here it won't, right? And then we have a metric called hits a 10, where we measure how many times, and it can be one, three, 10, 100. We measure how many times, um, how many triples in a test set show up in the top N position against some negatives. Again, Sounds very complex, but uh, with an example, uh, everything will, will will be clearer. So let's pretend we have a test set made of two triples, two positive triples that we carved out from the training set. Uh, usually test sets are obviously bigger. We had thousands of triples, but this example only has two, this and this, right? So the goal, the goal is to see how um, test positive triples rank against synthetic negatives, right? So we generate some synthetic negatives for each of them. Um, so we generate, for example, if this is the positive, we generate a synthetic negative here, a synthetic negative here. Usually we, we generate thousands of synthetic negatives, but for the sake of this, of this example, we generate four synthetic negatives per triple. We score each of them, right? We've uh, trained pre-trained model. We score the positive as well. And we we sort the scores and we, we compute the rank, right? Now, ideally, a perfect model will always score the positive first because it's like the model can predict can tell every time the, the 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 true fact from all its corruptions, but this does not always happen. And so sometimes, for example, like in this case, we get a rank worse than one. In this case here, the model was able to <clears throat> to capture perfectly the fact that the the positive was ranked first, right? Now, once we we, we repeat this 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 rank 
uh, with this ranking for, for each of the elements of the test set, for each, for each triple in the test set, and then we compute mean rank, mean reciprocal rank, and so on. Uh, mean rank is 1.5 because um, the, the rank was two, two plus one, and then we divide it by number of triples, which is two, we get 1.5, and then we proceed with the other metrics as well. Now, um, you'll see later on in the hands-on session that it's important to consider all these metrics together to give a, to get a good understanding of, of the performance of the model. In some cases, you may want to stick to one of the metrics instead of another. Usually in papers, we people fight uh, against each other on the mean reciprocal rank. But again, uh, in practical cases, uh, it's important to have a good, good overview of the interplay of these metrics, right? To, to determine the success of your training procedure. Now, there are some benchmark data sets out there, uh, which are uh, um, subsets of popular um, publicly available knowledge graphs like Freebase, WordNet, Yago. Again, they are, if you are familiar with data sets, benchmark data sets in graph neural networks, for example, you, you, you immediately realize that these guys here are way bigger. We have a quarter of a million triples here, a million triple here. So um, they're, they're, they're way bigger than uh, order of magnitude bigger than what's used in, in different communities, right? Now, um, I, I published some, some results uh, from the state of the art. I'm not going to go through these numbers, for, I mean, for, for what it's worth, either board, culture, it is, it is what it is. But it's important to point out that recently, um, papers have been um, shown to be um, quite, quite similar in terms of uh, predictive power, right? Uh, there is an interesting work by Rufinelli and, and colleagues published at iClear 2020. And we have, um, uh, if you guys can go mute, please, I can hear a bit of feedback. Thank you. Um, and there is, um, there, are, there are models which uh, fight against each other on, uh, just a few decimals on, on these on these data sets as you as you can see here with some exceptions but and and it's 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 interesting to see that um, independent experimental campaign this is something that we did here in in, in our in our lab we, we have an open source library that we developed we we came up with similar numbers and we, with values that that are pretty much in the same bracket right and so again um, which is why it's, it's important to keep in mind that some of the, of the models that you thought were probably old and outdated, when you mix and match loss functions, optimizers, scoring functions, regularizers, you retrain, you carry out a thorough hyperparameter search, well, it turned out that probably they, they're still like quite well performing, like, like this case here, or this case here. So, um, Whenever you look at the latest paper published in literature, keep in mind uh, fair comparisons are important and, and good results are obtained pretty much across the board um, recently when, when proper components are adopt adopted. And this is pretty much what I just said, right? So again, keep in mind uh, different training strategies, um, for example, how synthetic negatives are used, whether or not reciprocal relations are used in the training set, whether a good uh, hyperparameter search has been carried out or not. Um, the evaluation protocol also is tricky because uh, there, is, there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of different evaluation protocols out there. They look the same, but some of them, they differ in, in tiny little details, like for example, the behavior when ranks, when there's a tie in, in ranks. So um, again, um, you, you, you can look up the literature uh, for, for each of these uh, bullet points, especially a good discussion in this paper. And, and then again, don't, don't forget ablation studies. Sometimes you may see new papers that come in and they have groundbreaking results, but maybe those results are due to the fact that um, these papers use uh, a new optimizer or a more effective loss function. And what what is claimed to be the reason for such improvement in performance in the paper perhaps is 
not, and it's due to, to something else, some, some other component in architecture, perhaps some off-the-shelf components. So ablation studies are always very, very, very important, right? Okay, so having said that, I, I would like to, to spend a few words on some, I call them advanced knowledge graph embedding topics, right? And it's, it's like an overview of, of, of some uh, um, aspects which, which are important to consider when using these models in, in practice. One of these aspects is about calibrating probabilities, right? Um, one of the, of the problems KGE models have is that they're, they're uncalibrated, right? The, the scores returned by, by these, these um, scoring functions at inference time uh, they can be turned into probabilities by using a, a logistic function. But these probabilities are, are really uncalibrated. So if you're familiar with calibration uh, diagrams, um, a perfectly calibrated model, which is uh, uh, sh should look like the diagonal here. But these models, well, they do not. They do not look like that. They are extremely uncalibrated, uh, which means that, for example, if I return 75% uh, confidence for a, for a triple, it means that the model should be correct 75% of the time. So we should have a point that um, falls on the diagonal, but uh, these models may uh, undershoot or overshoot, right? So again, um, this means that discoveries which means predicting new facts may not be trusted that much by, by end users of these um, applications, right, of these pipelines. Also, that may hamper interpretability, uh, especially when you're working, say, in drug target discovery or in medical um, problems, right? So what we can ask ourselves, can we calibrate these models, right? And how can we do that without using negatives? And so um, we, we recently published a paper that shows that uh, by plugging in uh, off-the-shelf calibration technique uh, leads to calibrated probabilities, right? And this is all quite simple. When we have a data set made of ground truth positives and negatives, right? Because in some cases we are given negatives, especially in some niche um, applications, for example, I don't know, uh, thinking about, uh, specific cases of protein networks in literature, in medical literature, there are um, data sets of uh, ground truth false facts, right? But in most of the cases, we do not have synthetic negatives, right? So no ground truth negatives available, which is what happens in most of the times I told you about the open world assumption earlier on. So we take a pre-trained knowledge graph embedding model and again, we use calibration techniques, off-the-shelf calibration techniques. Uh, in this case, we have ground truth thought positives, but we need to plug in a synthetic negatives generation pipeline using the usual methods to generate negatives that I told you about. So we come up with a calibration data set that has ground truth positives and synthetic negatives. At that stage, we we, we define a positive base rate, which is a user-defined uh, hyperparameter, uh, an argument that we, we use to, to uh, calibrate the model. And we come up with probabilities which are better calibrated. And this is the result. Uh, again, um, the, this, this calibration plot should look like a, a, a diagonal line. And we see that the yellow and blue lines look way, way, way better than the red one which is the uncalibrated version. So consider that in your, in your uh, applicative um, projects. Calibration is important, and they will give you trustworthy, more trustworthy and interpretable predictions, right? It's, it's always better to, to work with a calibrated model than, than not, right? So this is one of the things which are um, discussed in literature recently, but there is a lot of work done also on so-called multimodal knowledge graphs. As I said earlier on in, in, in the talk, uh, many real-world knowledge graphs, well, by, besides including relations between concepts, for example, doubling capital of Ireland, 
some of these concepts may be associated to what we call multimodal attributes, numbers, uh, dates, text, images. Now the question is, what are we gonna do with these attributes? How are we gonna make the most out of them? So far I described models which are uh, which completely disregard uh, numeric or text or image attributes. But uh, knowledge graph embedding literature is ripe with models that are designed to leverage that information as well. Um, and, and research go, goes back to a couple of years ago with models such as KBLRN, literal E, or uh, MKBE, which is where I took this picture from, right? Um, you see that, again, in, in, this is a picture that comes from, from their paper, and they show how they are processing a subject relation and object triple, pretending that the object can be a multimodal um, concept. So it means that if it's just a concept, it goes through the usual uh, dense layer that we described earlier on, right? So Carl Puyol plays for Barcelona. But what if we also have, what if we also have uh, information on uh, Carl uh, Puyol and the year where, where Carl uh, was, was born, right? So we can we can process we can process with separate uh, neural differentiable pipelines an image to retrieve um, vector uh, vectors that can be injected in the in the um, rest of the architecture or we can process text with a uh, STM for example again to to learn uh, representations that can go back in the architecture or we can we can process uh, numeric literature li literals uh, or dates as well. And this is all interesting because the, the goal is to come up with better scores, right? Uh, better predictive power because we, we leverage this multimodality, right? Which can be very useful in some use cases, a bit less in others. But um, uh, all, all, all in all, I would, I would suggest to read uh, this recent uh, survey paper that covers the most recent developments in, in this area because it's it's quite one of the interesting uh, areas to look at research wise and speaking of multi speaking of multi modality we should we should consider as well that um, a lot of uh, real world graphs uh, well they represent uh, time stamped uh, concepts right so there are, I mean, time is, is, is an important dimension and sometimes it's considered a bit the, the big ugly in knowledge graphs because it's, it's hard to represent. Um, it's, 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 it's tricky. Uh, time is, is, is always a tricky aspect, uh, data representation wise. But if we limit to represent time as time stamped edges, right? Um, I literally took these triples from a data set called ICWS 14. So um, we know that Barack Obama made a statement about Russian military on 28 March 2014 and so on, right? All, all statements are time stamped. The question is, can we, can we design models that leverage time to improve predictions, right? And the answer is yes, we can. There is, um, there is a lot of work done recently in literature and quite a few models designed, uh, designed to, to learn from temporal knowledge graphs, graphs with timestamp edges, right? There may be other ways to model time in, in knowledge graphs, but let's leave that, that conversation aside, right? So lots of models are able to process timestamp edges at different time granularities. The most recent model is, has been published at iClear a few months ago. Um, it's called TNT Complex, and it works by generating embeddings for each timestamp using a um, order for tensor, uh, using a tensor decomposition approach, leveraging the complex the complex model that I that I described earlier on. The model that uses the dot product in the in the complex space, right? 
And there is, uh, there are a number of benchmark data sets. There are baselines and the community is starting to uh, put together models that work in, uh, that work better than, than the early proposals. Uh, these are models that um, are usually slower to train and they usually have uh, less powerful predictive power than, than traditional KG models uh, without, without time in the picture. But this is because this is a much harder problem to solve. So there is a lot of work to do to, to achieve, um, to achieve uh, even better models than the ones shown on the screen here, right? So this is a research direction in its infancy, if you want. Um, speaking of adding uh, numeric values to edges, there is a, a specific type of knowledge graphs, which we call uncertain knowledge graphs. And uncertain knowledge graphs are, uh, are knowledge graphs where each statement is associated with a level of confidence, right? Now, this this uh, happens if you want quite often when we have knowledge graphs when, when we process knowledge graphs that have been generated with um, uh, from from automatic pipeline, and it's it's in interesting to know that there are there are uh, models that are designed to learn from, from these uh, types of, 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 of graphs, right? Uh, also, it's, it's important to understand when, when talking about uh, topics around knowledge graph embeddings research, that uh, knowledge graph embeddings suffer from adversarial modifications. They're neural, neural architectures, and just like any other model, they, they suffer from adversarial attacks. And so if we think about predicting a link and we want to, this is the, the correct prediction, Princess Henriette has child in Violante Bavaria. And if we remove this fact though, what happens if we take it off? Well, we may come up with a different kind of prediction, which is wrong. Or instead of removing a fact, we may, we may add a fact, right? Uh, which also, um, affects the quality of the prediction, right? So it has been shown in literature that these, these uh, graph edit operations, that, that specific graph edit operations may affect the quality of predictions for link or for node classification, right? For example, if you want to classify accounts uh, or uh, as, as, as good or, or, or um, fraudulent in a fraud detection scenario. We may want to, again, delete certain edges and or add a new one so that the coloring is, is affected. So we, we, we should find, we should, we should think about techniques to, to protect from, from that, right? Again, very interesting research area with, with quite a lot of um, things going on. There are recent papers that, that show that this is doable and that, uh, for example, works like triage show that um, adding an increasing number of perturbations decreases the the score of MRR. You see that it goes down by by ten base points. So um, this these techniques are uh, quite interesting and they're quite effective when adding new edges or when deleting new new edges in uh, existing edges in the graph if the attacker has access to 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 that obviously now there is then a whole an entire area uh, dedicated to neurosymbolic reasoning for example injecting background knowledge with soft constraints right uh, which is um, uh, it belongs to to all sort of work that tries to mix and match Rule-based approaches with in, in in with differentiable uh, pipelines like like the ones that we described. Again, uh, we may find with rule extraction the some some of the axioms in some some predicate types in in the graph are the same, and so we may want to use that information injected as a regularizer and improve the predictive power, or we can even go further by uh, using um, 
adopting neurosymbolic reasoning techniques. Uh, the, the work done on neural theorem provers is very interesting because it's it's um, it's a line of work where the authors mix rule-based models and knowledge graph embeddings uh, because they, they want to make the best out of both words, the interplay of the strength of knowledge graph embeddings, where they, which are known for generalizing well and scale well, with rule-based systems that are interpretable and they're capable to learn from small data, right? And so these, these uh, neural theorem provers, they, they implement backward chaining reasonably, re reason, uh, reasoning, in, in a, and this is the, the interesting fact, the interesting aspect in a fully differentiable fashion, right? So it's like they, they compare, they, they, they carry out prolog backward chaining, but they compare um, embeddings instead of comparing symbols so that they can uh, support things like comparing grandpa and grandfather and they have a better, more effective um, reasoning, reasoning chain. So again, very interesting line, line of work. And, but it's not the only one. We, we see how other reasoning regimes are integrated into knowledge graph embedding architectures, for example, when, when trying to use uh, uh, analogical structures, analogical reasoning, for example, leverage analogical reasoning so that if sun is surrounded by planets and attracts mass, by analogical reasoning, we scale down sun to nucleus and planets to electrons. And we may try to predict that the uh, nucleus attracts a charge by analogy with the sun that attracts a mass. And this is, this is the idea behind analogical reasoning, but if we can make that idea differentiable, right? We can combine it with knowledge graph embedding models and come up with more powerful models that, that, that cherry pick the best aspects from, from different, different worlds. Again, then there are lots of work, uh, lots of work done in answering complex queries, for example, reasoning over knowledge graphs in, in uh, vector space using box embeddings, which is, which is also quite interesting. I'll, I'll leave you that for details um, in, in the slides. And I will conclude by showing some research questions um, before handing over to my colleagues, which, which, are, uh, which are interesting, right? And which is what the community is looking at, definitely looking at getting more expressive models, right? Uh, keep trying to model all those regularities, but keeping runtime complexity low. Support for multimodality, especially node and edge attributes, right? Or time awareness, which is still in its infancy, as I said. Uh, work for work towards robustness and interpretable results, right? Protect from adversarial attacks, explain, dissect techniques, um, come up with explanation pipelines, uh, black box explanation and whatever. Come up with better benchmarks, uh, improve the, the evaluation uh, protocol, which is currently used by, by the community, propose new data sets, and move, generally speaking, beyond the prediction, show how you can predict multi-path queries, um, use KGE to inject knowledge in larger architectures, and, and, and look at integration between um, symbolic um, reasoning and, and neural architecture. So we have lots of different uh, aspects to to consider. All right, that's that's about it. I I I am on top of my my slot. One hour and thirty minutes. I will uh, just stay uh, a few minutes on on Q and A, and so I am cherry picking some questions from the from the from the chat. Thanks for asking that. And uh, let me let me see, for example, some of them. Um, uh, Nico asks, uh, can you talk a little bit about the trade-off of the different loss functions that you introduced here? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And in, in fairness, I it's 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 hard to to tell in advance which uh, loss function will be the best, right? 
Um, I would always encourage running comprehensive model selection for that. Um, usually the most performing ones are uh, uh, multi-class uh, NLL or uh, uh, negative log likelihood. Uh, the, the margin-based approach uh, probably does not come up with the best results in, in literature, but there are, again, it, it may it may really depend on the hyperparameters that you use, for example, the margin. So it's all about model, model selection, right? Um, then, there is, uh, there is a question on synthetic negatives. I'm going to take only this one, and then I'm going to um, take the others in the chat because uh, I want to hand over to, um, to Sumit and Nick for the applicative part. So Sumit and Nick, you can pull up your slides already. So um, Jessica asks, uh, when synthetic negatives are created, it is assumed that there are some sort of rules in the ontology that states that a person can be born in one and only one place. Right to that, it seems that it may introduce systematic errors for particular relationships. Exactly. Yeah, and do current implementations take the nature of particular relations into account? It's a good question, uh, Jessica and Nico. And the answer is, in, in theory, we should generate negatives uh, by being semantically aware, right? We should, we should generate good negatives. The better the negatives, the better the training, right? But it's, it's also through that all those techniques take um, a, a lot of time. They don't scale as well as the simple one that I showed. And when using such technique on large data sets um, with lots of triples and lots of negatives and lots of variety in the entities that you use, it has been shown in literature that it doesn't matter that much um, the, if, you, if you generate bad negatives, negatives which are sometimes not, not very meaningful. Um, but I agree with you. Uh, it would be interesting to see what happens uh, with a good um, experimental analysis when we replace that with uh, better ways to generate negatives. All right. Uh, so I don't have time to take other questions live, but I will get back to you on the chat. Uh, I will hand over now to Sumit and Nick for the applicative part. Sumi technique, all all yours. Yeah. Um, hi, Luca. Uh, can you guys hear me? Like, uh, is it loud and clear? Okay. Uh, there's a request to take a break. Uh, like, so shall we break for like two minutes or something? We can break for a couple of minutes. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Uh, but uh, let's keep it literally to a couple of minutes. Otherwise, we'll we'll run we'll run late. Yeah. Okay. Let's resume in a couple of minutes. By the way, can you see, uh, see my slides? Yes. Okay, uh, shall we start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope I'm 
like audible to everyone so you are, go ahead yeah uh, so so in this section uh, myself and nick so we'll just give you uh, an overview of uh, some of the applicative use cases that are commonly used uh, like that we uh, you know tried out and so on so you'll get a brief overview of some of the use cases so so first i'll just uh, walk you through some of the use cases that you see here so like uh, you have uh, uh, knowledge graph embeddings uh, being used in uh, different uh, industries for example in pharmaceutical industry for side effects prediction and so on in human resources for product recommendation and uh, like uh, in uh, uh food and beverage industry like for uh, flavors and so on so so these are some of the use cases that we'll target to cover uh in this section uh so first uh, let's look at the use case of uh drug development so so if you see here uh, uh you can see these block diagrams so here each uh, block specifies a step during the drug development process and uh, so uh, in this context i am talking about drug development from the genetic perspective so let's say you want to uh, cure a disease say something like diabetes uh, you would try to come up with a genetic solution to it so try to identify a gene which can be used to target uh, diabetes uh, so so if you look at these steps here the first step would be the identification of the gene itself and then once you have identified the gene uh, you do some kind of validations uh, like uh, uh, whether it's a feasible gene whether you can target the gene with some particular compound uh, and uh, and so on and then uh, you would go to pre preclinical trials where you would test on animals uh, and then you would go for uh, uh, clinical trials on human beings and so on and finally once everything is uh, safe and uh, like if the drug is found to be uh, like if the efficacy of drug is good then you would go for uh, regulatory approvals and then you would finally manufacture the drug so uh, so if you look at this entire process it takes about 7 to 10 years uh, but uh, the problem is like there there's a lot of chance of failure uh, like during this process like you might fail somewhere in middle of this process especially if you don't get the gene correct uh, at the first step so you might lose a lot of money and time uh, so and if you look at it uh, like human body has like thousands of genes uh, in it so getting this initial gene for uh, treating a particular disease can be extremely complex uh, so usually in these uh, pharmaceutical industries uh, there are these people uh, who work specifically on this uh, so say like the drug developers uh, and they do so by looking at the latest research that's out there so they'll if if you are interested in diabetes you'll go online look for different research you'll do it yourself in your lab and so on so so all this process takes about one or two years like the very first step of identifying this gene so uh, and it's uh, highly dependent on the drug developer's experience so uh, how good he is at choosing this gene right so how can we use uh, knowledge graph embeddings here uh, to solve this problem so so if you see here we have built a knowledge graph uh, from a genetic perspective especially like uh, if you see here like you have type 1 diabetes uh, uh, so you have a gene ndufa4 which causes type 1 diabetes so you already have a known drug for this uh, which targets that gene but let's say uh, over time like the efficacy goes down and so on so you might want to identify a new gene uh, to cure the same disease or maybe you are interested in some other disease for which uh, a known gene doesn't exist so in in that case you would build a knowledge graph like this uh, by combining different data sets uh, about genes and genetic associations and so on and once you have that knowledge graph what you can do is you can use knowledge graph embedding models uh, to uh, to learn from these kind of graphs and do link prediction and knowledge discovery uh, on top of it so so the red lines that you see here could be something like uh, the knowledge graph embedding model once it learns the complex interactions it predicts these kind of uh, associations that might exist in this data set so so as a drug developer what would happen is 
uh, once we have this knowledge graph our knowledge graph embedding model would give me like a list of genes uh, sorted on some priority so uh, so as luca mentioned about calibration and you know like the ranking protocol so you can you can get uh, a prioritized list of genes uh, and then as a drug developer i can uh, look at the evidences behind it uh, like given by my model and then i can proceed my research further so I, i this can help me save a lot of time doing my own research as a drug developer like going online looking at individual papers so so that's how this is in one way you can use knowledge graph embeddings so uh, there are other use cases like uh, in pharma industry like for example drug side effect prediction determining the risk factors for a particular disease and so on so the way it works is build this knowledge graph uh, run knowledge graph and embedding model on top of it and then do the link prediction and usually uh, it's not a simple uh, graph because it uh, so here you see only a few nodes but uh, if you look at it from an industrial perspective you would have like millions of nodes and uh, uh, billions of links uh, between the nodes so uh, so let's look at another use case uh, that's from a human resource perspective so uh, nowadays like technology is evolving extremely fast and like uh, a lot of new libraries if you say like if you if you're working in uh, research you would see like a lot of libraries are coming up a lot of new technologies are coming up so uh, so to stay relevant uh, in this industry uh, you need to learn new skills uh, otherwise you know you might lose out uh, getting a promotion or something like that so uh, so and also like nowadays due to automation or maybe if you see now because of covid like a lot of projects are closing down and companies are forced to lay off people uh, but this can so you can use knowledge graph embeddings to somehow like uh, find a new role for uh, these kind of people uh, and uh, say if, uh, say for the first uh, use case that i mentioned uh, you can use knowledge graph embeddings to suggest new technologies that one can learn to stay relevant in market and for the second one the companies can look for similar roles uh, based on you know what a, what an employee is working on and try to shift him to that department or to that role so that's how knowledge graph embeddings can be used uh, so for example let's say you have a, a employee uh, skills graph like this so like for example employee knows some skills uh, employee uh, works on some activities uh, and like for a role these are the activities that are usually done so if you have a graph like this uh, you can like uh, say as an employee i want to progress further in my career so i i'm good in programming i'm skilled in like hadoop, uh, hadoop and so on but say i want to progress further in career uh, say like the knowledge graph embedding model can learn from the interactions here and suggest this employee that oh you oh you need to uh, know more about the od concepts to progress further so this is something that you know uh, uh, the knowledge graph embeddings can be uh, used for so uh, let's like look, uh, look at the next use case that's of a uh, product recommendation so again here uh, what knowledge graph embedding models can do is they can leverage relationships between customers and products for example let's say a customer is a friend with another customer and products are similar so all these uh, relational uh, you know interactions can be captured by these kind of models which would otherwise not be possible by a say a recommender system and so on because they are not relational based so uh, uh so yeah so that's how knowledge graph embeddings can be used uh so for example say you have a graph like this of uh, customer purchase patterns so like customer purchase some products uh the product belongs to particular category uh, and you know like customers are friends of some other customers so you can like suggest say Uh, say this guy brought a, a bought a phone uh, and you see like people buying a phone also buy screen, screen protector so the model can suggest uh, this customer to buy a screen protector so this is a simple example that i gave but uh, so this is just to get an idea of uh, how knowledge graph embedding models can be used so uh, so now i'll hand over to nick uh, who will uh, talk about the next uh, use cases so nick uh, Yeah, Thank right. you so much. Uh, can we just confirm I'm coming through loud and clear? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. 
Okay, uh, so hello everyone. Um, so in this next applicative example, uh, I'm going to discuss um, how you can apply graph embeddings in the manufacturing and retail space. Uh, so there are probably a lot of reasons that you might want to apply them here. Um, but the main ones that we're going to consider are, for instances, of product reformulation um, and adaptation to consumer trends. Uh, in the first instance, a very simple example um, for, for where you might want to, to do product reformulation is uh, in instances of, of supply chain disruption um, or where you have regulatory changes um, that require uh, changes to existing products. In the second, it might be considering how you can adapt uh, existing products to new changes in consumer markets and trends. Uh, so the graph we're looking at on screen, uh, it, it's not the real graph, it's just a schema um, showing a recipe ingredient graph. So these aren't the actual relations, uh, it's just illustrating how each concept um, in a graph is connected. So on the left, we have the high level concept like recipe uh, and the associated kind of metadata like relations for them. Uh, in the center, we have ingredients. Um, and then we add a number of relations to each ingredient, uh, describing the various perceptual qualities such as flavor and texture. Um, and then also diving deeper into the, the kind of biochemistry of, of each ingredients by including uh, compounds and nutrients and um, the different flavors favorite qualities that each compound can bring. Uh, it's also important to point out, I think at this point, that we're not really considering the full manufacturing process in it. So we're, we're not telling you how to, to join everything. Um, but it, this is more of a, uh, as a method of um, computational design. So how you can generate novel combinations or take an existing um, recipe or formulation uh, and find um, new, new ways to put it together. Um, but the same idea will, will work if, if you were to take this and apply it in similar domains. Um, so um, maybe you want to dive, dive deeper on compounds. So similar to Sumit's um, explanation of, of the process in drug discovery. Um, if we had products that include many different compounds, maybe we want to look at ways that we can find um, compounds that have similar properties to that. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll include a slide later that illustrates how you can kind of create a, a knowledge graph like this uh, and adapt it to your specific use case. Um, we flick to the next slide, so much. Thank you. Uh, so on this slide, I'm just showing a very, very stripped down set of facts from the full graph uh, describing a recipe for hummus. So you can see the, uh, the ingredients that are contained on the left and um, where hummus originates from. Uh, and then I'm just in the interest of actually displaying um, or, or giving a sense of, of how the, the full graph would look. I've just focused on garlic cloves and some of the compounds uh, that are um, present or contained within it. So in our example, um, if we are a manufacturer that produces hummus and suddenly we have a disruption to our supply chain and we're unable to source garlic cloves, um, we could do a very simple item substitution using a graph like this um, based purely on uh, entity embedding proximity to find, a, to, to find a suitable replacement for garlic cloves. Um, and again, depending on the, um, the kinds of, of facts that we're including in a knowledge graph, um, we'll get different kinds of uh, suggestions on this. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, another uh, use case we'll look at is item, recommend, item recommendation. Um, so for this instance, we just we we'll, we'll say just use simple vector algebra uh, in order to find latent regions that satisfy a particular input criteria. Uh, so in the example here, uh, we're just going to consider if I want Indian recipes that contain garlic and tomato. Um, so on the uh, uh, diagram on the right, you can see just, I, again, it's not a, a real diagram, just for, for illustration. Um, we can see the two entities, garlic and tomato. Uh, so we're taking kind of the average of their regions within the latent space. Uh, we're taking the reciprocal of the contains ingredient relation to bring us to the, the region of latent space containing recipes with, uh, with, with garlic and tomato. 
Um, and then we're also taking the India concept and taking the reciprocal, reciprocal of the recipe origin to bring us to uh, recipes that um, should originate in India. Um, and in this, in this case, it's, it's again, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of put the algebra together to get um, answers for this. Um, we're just taking the nearest recipes in the overlap of these two regions. Um, but again, depending on um, you know, the model, um, the data you're using, it, you'll get uh, different results um, and maybe want to adjust the kind of uh, algebraic solutions you're coming up with. So I think this example is, is really more pseudocode. Um, alternatively, there are methods using Bayesian optimization where you can specify uh, input criteria and, and come to different solutions, but that's really beyond the scope of this tutorial. Um, so if we flick to the next slide, uh, we will show just, um, just to give you an idea of really how easy it is to kind of come up with um, or to construct knowledge graphs um, for applications like this. Um, so you can see on the top, we we'll just take a number of different data sets um, going from the high level recipe space down to PubChem, uh, which you know, includes a um, huge amount of different data points for, for compounds and molecules and how they interact. Um, the main trick in, in producing these kind of graphs, whatever your application is, um, is on the entity matching. Uh, this will probably take up most of your time if you're doing so. You, again, uh, I deliberately chose garlic for the previous example because uh, garlic has um, so many different concepts associated with it. There's garlic cloves, there's chopped garlic, there's the smell of garlic, there's the taste of garlic, there's the texture of garlic. So um, when you're dealing with raw data sets and trying to merge them like this, uh, it's important to be um, aware of these kind of uh, uh, disambiguation requirements. Um, but again, it's, it's just to, to illustrate that you can take off the shelf publicly available data sets um, and, and make some really, really interesting applications um, in the space. Uh, and then on the last slide, uh, I won't really go through them, but if you're um, interested in, in, in applying these in different scenarios here. Here's a list of some um, research papers in, in different areas. Um, so one, one good one is Biokeen, that, that's related to the PyKeen library. Um, and there's, oh, I've lost the slides. Um, uh, but uh, when we post the slides up on the GitHub after this, um, or if you have an application area, uh, I recommend taking a look at these papers. Thank you. Uh, I think we're now going to move to Adriana. Um, or yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick. I think in the meanwhile, yeah, go ahead, Adriana. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, just a second to put up the slides and we can start. Here. Okay. Can you hear? Uh, can you see my? Can you hear yes. the slides? Yeah. Oh. Great. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Again, I hope you're enjoying uh, the tutorial, and I will talk about a software ecosystem around uh, knowledge graph embeddings. And yeah, let me go through agenda first. So uh, we will be talking about the different libraries uh, that you can uh, find around uh, to work with uh, knowledge graph embeddings. And we will uh, see a quick overview of uh, what is out there and uh, then do a short comparison uh, between between libraries uh, according to features, scalability, whether state of the art uh, was uh, reported, reproduced, and and uh, software development practices. Uh, then we will conclude with uh, which uh, with the section on which library to use. So. 
uh, last few years brought a lot of uh, Kaji libraries and uh, starting from 2016 uh, with Psychit Kaji uh, published with the Holy Paper and uh, but currently this library is uh, disconnected uh, mm, this discontinued and then we we, we we saw open ke uh, in May 2018 and then after a long while uh, uh, 2019 uh, brought uh, ampligraph uh, which which was followed by uh, Python's big graph Pikaji to uh, Lipkaji and Gravite all in the same year and then uh, Year 2020 uh, brought uh, Pykin and DGLK. So as we can see, there is a lot of uh, libraries available and uh, we will have a look at uh, some of them. And uh, yeah, so we will look at the features that each library has, uh, scalability and uh, whether state of the art was reproduced. Uh, I think somebody's not on mute, so could you please go on mute? Thanks. And uh, then the software, the software development uh, practices. So let's start with uh, features. Mm -hmm. Here uh, we will look at the models, uh, pre-trained models, and some other add-ons that are offered with the libraries. So at the core of uh, KGE uh, is a model. And as Luca explained before, uh, there is a plethora of models available. And uh, also you can see it here uh, when we have all the libraries uh, with uh, listed uh, models that they contain. Uh, there's another slide with even more uh, models. So as you can see, there's a lot. And uh, but but the point is that uh, it really depends on uh, what your use case is, uh, whether you are doing uh, theoretical research and you need to uh, compare, let's say, different uh, different approaches, or uh, you have an applicative use case when you just want to uh, have a high accuracy and and a good performance of a model. Uh, so. It, it may not be necessarily relevant to have a lot of models um, when when you when when you need uh, good performance and uh, well developed uh, let's say applicative path. So some of the most common models are uh, trans CD smooth complex. You can see they are available in almost all libraries, and there are some variations across the rest of the models uh, which library provide uh what what models uh so you can you can have a look at that and see maybe some use case uh, you need uh, depends on the model that is offered uh then we will switch on another aspect of uh of 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 libraries uh on pre-trained models so sometimes uh when it, all you care about is downstream task, uh, you may not have uh, resources for training your own your own uh, knowledge graph embedding, and uh, the availability of a pre-trained model uh, would be crucial here. So, because it takes a lot of time uh, to train a model and also space uh, and skill, you uh, you you can benefit from some pre-trained models that are available for some libraries. For example, Wikidata is available for OpenKE, PyTorch, BigGraph, and Gravite, DeepKGE, uh, some fragments of Freebase is available for OpenKE. Uh, some libraries also offer uh, benchmark data sets, pre-trained models. So this is yet another, uh, yet another aspect. Mm. Now we will switch to other features and add-ons specific to libraries. So um, because there is no like uh, criteria that we could uh, expand on here, so it's just uh, all the all the features were like gathered together. So if you 
you if you need uh, some C++ implementation, you can go to OpenKE as this library has this implementations. Um, maybe you need some more uh, help in benchmarking or pre-processing and um, uh, also like different formats. Um, like RDF, CSV, and triples, you can uh, look into Ampligraph, which also has knowledge discovery and model selection APIs, uh, visualization, and uh, support via Slack, and call-up tutorials. Uh, then we have uh, PyTorch BigGraph PBG, which has a slightly different approach than the other libraries, as it does not offer models as such. It offers high-level operators that you can com combine together and uh, create models. Uh, so it's maybe suitable for more uh, skilled users. Uh, it also presents like scalability, extended scalability through partitioning and experimental GPU. Uh, then DGLKE also is um, is good uh, with scal scalable uh, applications um, when it provides partitioning with uh, Metis and uh, it's faster than Gravite and PyTorch BigGraph. Then we have a PyKin uh, that has a uh, possibility to in incorporate multi-model information and it's uh, extensible uh, with a wide, ver wide range of interchangeable components. Uh, that you can uh, just plug and play, let's say. Then uh, hy it has also hyperparameters support via external software called Optuna. Uh, Pika G2Vec uh, has uh, some uh, visualization and in interactive results inspector and also automatic discovery for hyperparameters. And libkg also has hyperparameter support with Bayesian optimization and resuming training configuration with uh, YAML fine, uh, which is also available in Gravvite, which is also scalable um, with GPU CPU hybrid. Uh, it also contains um, different paradigm uh, models uh, for node embedding API and has custom input data parser and visualization and auto-deduction of hyperparameters. So there's a lot there and, and uh, the list probably is not closed. Uh, now let's switch to scalability. Um, when we cannot use pre-trained models, uh, we may need to train them on our own. So, and sometimes when the graph is uh, too big, uh, we may need to uh, scale through distributed execution, uh, which is offered uh, by PyTorch BigGraph, uh, Gravvite, DGLKE, and uh, and uh, yeah, and this is uh, something to have in mind. Uh, also, another important aspect is uh, the core framework. Uh, so different libraries uh, support different frameworks, like uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow. Majority support PyTorch. But if you are familiar already with TensorFlow, it may be more comfortable for you to uh, to to use the library that supports TensorFlow, like AmpliGraph, OpenKE, or PyKG to VEC. On the right hand side, you also have uh, biggest graphs reported by the paper. So uh, yeah, uh, let's move to. The next aspect, uh, whether state of the art was reproduced or rather reported, uh, because it's uh, one of the very important uh, part of the library, whether it's up to a certain standard or not. And uh, let's let's have a look here. Uh, so in this slide, we can see uh, the the metric that is uh, just like models uh, reported versus models uh, present in the library. Uh, so you can see that some uh, some models are not uh, tested against the benchmark data set. So it may be difficult to, uh, to, to assess whether the models will perform well uh, on a real task unless you do this extra step and compare that by yourself. 
let's move on to the software development, uh, which is our final section here. And uh, we will be looking into different metrics. Um, and but but why we look at it in the first place? So uh, when you have a library which is well documented, well tested, and that follows uh, good practices, it's much easier to uh, learn and uh, use this library, and uh, the learning curve is is less uh, steep to do so. And following good practice is important for uh, quality reasons as well. So we looked at uh, four different uh, metrics uh, for documentation and tests coverage, uh, good practices, and uh, code complexity with Maccabi complexity. So let's have a look. S we can see here that uh, that that uh, in the documentation coverage, uh, we we can see that uh, AmpliGraph may be uh, better documented than other libraries, uh, which is following by PyKeen, then pkg 2 vec and so on. Some other libraries are not well documented. In the test coverage, we can see that the leader is uh, PyTorch BigGraph and pkg 2 vec following AmpliGraph. Then we have good practices. Um, when we have like pkg 2 vec which is leading the way, then libkge and uh, pytorch BigGraph. So we can see that um, there are different, uh, different levels of good practices, documentation coverage and test coverage. Uh, we, we would like to have like 10 in good practices and 100% documentation coverage and 100% test coverage. Uh, but sometimes it may not be possible, but uh, well, uh, that's, that, that, that can suggest that the code is very readable and, um, and high quality. Then we have average co code complexity. And here, all the libraries uh, like scored in the were class in class A, so uh, it, it it wasn't so complex here. So, um, so it was good. Now let's uh, switch to the final section. Uh, so, you may ask like which library should I use, and uh, the answer is not. Uh, not not easy because there are many factors, uh, your task and time that you have to for learning the library, um, whether it is applicative scenario or uh, theoretical where you try to extend uh, the, the area of knowledge, uh, it, it, the, the choice may be different. Uh, also, the, your experience may play a part, uh, whether you use PyTorch or TensorFlow library or maybe some other library in the future that will be introduced or, uh, or something else. But also like your experience with knowledge graph embeddings and, and uh, coding, what features does the library support? And uh, if you can, uh, get some community support, uh, maybe through, I don't know, Twitter, or Weibo, or Slack, or uh, whatever uh, the developers uh, use to communicate and uh, support uh, you, uh, or if at all. Uh, then scale scalability, uh, what, what is uh, the maximum that you need, and uh, User friendliness, maturity of the project, accuracy very important, and maybe some supported add-ons that are uh, that that you may need. Uh, you can use tools like GitHub Statistics to support yourself, uh, which uh, can give you some other overview as well. Uh, but finally, the choice is yours and uh, align it with with uh, your needs. Thank you very much and. Uh, here I point also some resources to the mentioned libraries and references for adequate papers. And um, yeah, I think that's that's it from my side. Uh, the slides will be available after the tutorial on the website. So I encourage you to download and explore the pointers later. 
now we will switch to the hands-on session. So thank you, Adriana. Thank you so much and enjoy the hands-on. Thanks, thanks everybody. So as you can see here, uh, we have a hands-on session starting straight away. Um, it's gonna be a walkthrough presented by Sumit and Nick. Uh, again, we are taking all your questions in the chat. We, we, we are refreshing the page uh, from time to time. So um, we'll make sure to answer everybody. And you see there's a link. If you click on the link, that will bring you to a call-up notebook that Sumit and Nick put together. And I'm gonna hand over to them now. Yeah. Uh... So thanks, Luca. So now, uh, like, uh, you guys can click on that link and it will take you to the collab page. So, uh, so the point of this tutorial is that uh, you can run, uh, you know, like the code along with us. So all you have to do is once you are on your collab page. Uh, so can you guys see my screen, by the way? We cannot. Yes. You cannot. Okay, Not let yet. me just uh, try sharing it again. Yeah, what about now? Not yet. Okay, let me just refresh it once. Uh, just give me a second. What about now? Is it working with... fine? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so now you will be able to see this collab screen, and uh, you can run uh, run the code along with me. So all you have to do is like uh, on the top right, you can click on connect to hosted runtime, and then it will connect to like the GPU instance and so on. So, uh, yeah. So. Uh, so let's uh, start uh, start with the hands-on session. So uh, so what we'll do is uh, initially uh, I'll just show you how to train some models using knowledge graph embeddings. I'll just walk you through a small knowledge graph. Uh, I, I'll show you like uh, how you can evaluate these kind of models, uh, and then later you, uh, like Nick will show you like uh, some downstream tasks that you can do with knowledge graph embedding models. And for this uh, tutorial, we'll be using an open source library called AmpliGraph. So that's developed by uh, Accenture, and it's open sourced. Uh, so uh, so let's start by installing the dependencies. Oops. Yeah. Uh, so first, we'll install TensorFlow. So here, we just select the version of TensorFlow since we are on Collab. Uh, but if you are running it on your own machines, you can like run this, uncomment this cell, and you can uh, run it. But for now, let's just run it on Collab. So we use TensorFlow, and uh, like we load TensorFlow. We install the other dependencies, that's AmpliGraph, TensorBoard, and some other dependencies that we'll be using later. Uh, so it's installing the dependencies. And then uh, once the dependencies are installed, what we can do is we can uh, we can load all the necessary uh, libraries. Uh, but I mean, for now, just run this cell. But we'll uh, talk about this in detail later. So yeah. So now uh, to start with, uh, like uh, in the applicative examples, and as Luca mentioned, you saw that we need a knowledge graph for this. So uh, there are a lot of uh, standard knowledge graphs out there. And AmpliGraph provides uh, an API. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so under ampligraph.datasets module, you can load like the standard knowledge graphs that are out there, like Freebase, uh, WN18, uh, and Yago. So uh, this is something that Luca mentioned uh, in his uh, session. Uh, but uh, for this tutorials, we'll use uh, use Freebase uh, 237 dataset, and we have like remapped it to uh, like uh, human readable IDs. Uh, so uh, I'll just run this cell, and this will load the dataset. So as you see here in this data set, uh, you have like uh, triples uh, made of subject, predicate, and object. So I'm just showing you, showing you like the first five triples. Uh, so you can see like uh, Queen's College. Uh, so it's an educational institution where K 
Carol Leifer studied. So you have like triples like this. So uh, so in general, so if I run this, I'll, I'll know like uh, how many triples are there in our data set. And you see here, like we have close to 300,000 triples. Uh, so, so this is how the knowledge graph uh, would look like. So, uh, if uh, so, this is a small section of the, uh, you know, like the knowledge graph that I loaded. Uh, so it's related to Star Wars. So, like Harrison Ford acted in Star Wars, uh, Carrie Fisher acted in Star Wars, and so on. So, so you have a knowledge graph like this with lots of nodes and relations in it. So. Uh, so like our standard machine learning tasks, uh, like we need to have a training set, validation set, and test set. So, uh, so first, let's generate this from our data set. So AmpliGraph provides uh, uh, a method called train, test, split, no unseen. So that's under AmpliGraph.evaluation, which generates the test set uh, by uh, splitting, uh, splitting the data set into multiple parts. So we use this function specifically because we need to have uh, entities that are only seen during training. So if an unseen entity occurs, so while training, you might have not, uh, you might have not uh, trained on it. So you won't have an embedding for it. So just like any standard, uh, you know, like uh, NLP task, you need to have seen entities during your uh, test set when you are evaluating. So that's why we use this API. Uh, so here we are saying like use this data set uh, give me uh, 500 triples in the validation set and give me 1,000 in the test set, and the rest are put in train. So ultimately, these are the sizes of our uh, data sets. So now, uh, as Luca mentioned, like uh, one of the earliest models uh, and one of the simplest models in knowledge graph community is the TranC model. So, uh, so let's use this for our tutorials, and uh, let's uh, train this mo uh, model with the training set that we created. So if you see here, uh, this is our transi model, and it has a few uh, parameters, like k. So k specifies the embedding size. Uh, so uh, we set it to 150. Uh, we train it for 100 epochs. And uh, in each epoch, like we divide our data set into 10 batches. So we use batch count instead of batch size. But it's like, uh, just uh, can. Uh, so what it says is like our entire data set would be divided into 10 batches. And then these are the corruptions that are generated during training. So as Luca mentioned about uh, synthetic uh, negatives, so that's what uh, this does. So for every training example, we generate exactly one corruption during training. And then we have the loss, the pairwise loss that Luca mentioned, along with its parameters, the hyperparameters of that, so its margin, and you have like other uh, you know, like initializers, regularizers, optimizers, and so on. So we trained the model and we just saved it. Uh, so now, uh, so now that the model is trained, let's look at some of the evaluation metrics that uh, Luca had mentioned earlier in the tutorials. So uh, the first, uh, so you can categorize these metrics into two parts. One is per triple metrics. So this is like you get this per triple in your test set, and then you have aggregate metrics. So aggregate metrics can be used for, uh, you know, like uh, getting the quality of the model on your test set. So these are like MRR, MR, and so on. What Luca mentioned earlier. So uh, so let's first look at the score. So consider a test triple like this: Harrison Ford performed in Star Wars. So now uh, what we can do is on the train model we can call model dot predict. So it returns a score. So uh, based on the embeddings that it learned. And you can see, like, for this triple, you get a negative score of uh, minus 8. So uh, so the score depends on the type of model that you, are, you have used. So in, in case of Transy, the scores are always between 0 and uh, minus infinity. But depending on the choice of the model, it can be between plus infinity and minus infinity. So, uh, so again, this score is uh, based on the model you choose. And it's not between 0 and 1. It's all. It's between minus infinity and plus infinity. Uh, so now, what does this score tell me? So if I just look at the score, minus 8, so it doesn't tell me anything. It's just a score, right? So, uh, so how can we use this score? This is something we have to see now. Uh, so, so there are two ways in which we, we can use. So one is uh, by creating a list of hypotheses that we want to test. So this is like. 
i want to test certain things uh, and i want to choose from these uh, lists like the hypothesis that i have i i, I want to choose the top uh, top hypothesis like which gets the highest score as true so this is what i do so for example i want to find uh, so amongst all these actors that i have who acted in star wars right so let's say i don't know anything about star wars and i just have these uh, list of actors so what i do is i generate a hypothesis like this uh, actors acted in star wars so i'll use this list of actors and i'll use model dot predict to predict the scores and once i have the scores uh, i'll just sort this based on the scores so as you can as you can see you have now a sorted list of uh, you know the hypothesis that i generated so now you can see like the top 3 predicted here are the top 4 actually they are from star wars mark hamill was luke skywalker and then you have like han solo uh, and so on so so uh, so as you can see this is one way in which you can use it you can create your own set of hypothesis and then you can score it and then sort it and then from that you can choose uh, you know like the top n triples uh, uh, to be true triples so this is one way the second way is ranking so ranking is uh, something that luca had mentioned earlier the ranking protocol where you uh, so so you can look at this uh, uh, pseudo code later so just to give you a brief uh, recap so you have a triple uh, so harrison ford acted in star wars you score it and then you generate synthetic negatives using all the entities in your data set and then you score that and then once you have the scores of negatives and your true triple you rank it so if it gets a good rank so that's uh, the model performs good or you can also say it's a true fact so this this statement can be a true fact because it is having a good rank compared to its corruptions so you, we have an illustrative example on how to do this but uh, i won't uh, run through this example uh so uh, when uh, so you can run this later i mean the tutorial is only 1 hour so i can't run each and every cell so let's skip this illustrative example and let's directly uh, move to filtered evaluation section so uh, so you can run the uh, cells later so now uh, so as luca mentioned like uh, you know once you have these kind of uh, uh, negatives you filter out the true positive statements right so this is what is called as filtered evaluation because in the example that you saw like when you generate these negatives uh, you can have uh, positives in that like carry fisher acted in star wars right so that is a that is not actually a corruption but actually a true positive so to remove that what we do is we specify uh, the filters so the true positive statements that were observed during training and that also may be facts so we uh, so we concatenate train test and validation set and then we call evaluate performance uh, so this is an api that ampligraph provides uh, under ampligraph.evaluation module and you can pass the test triple to it along with the filters and then it will give you the ranks so for now uh, yeah so here i'm just passing one triple so you get the rank for that triple harrison ford acted in star wars uh so now uh, let's look at some of the aggregate metrics so uh, so per triple metrics gives you uh like rank and score per triple in your test set but aggregate metrics are used to evaluate the quality of the model so in order to evaluate quality of the model uh you need to have uh the test set made up of only true statements because quality can be evaluated uh, in this uh, you know um, community using true statements so uh, and using the ranking protocol that was mentioned earlier so if you see here uh, you have a set of five statements that i chose so these are like uh, true statements like star was currency was united uh, like uh, usd like uh, dollars similarly uh, star wars language english harrison ford performed in star wars and so on so when i run this and uh, evaluate on these five triples 
what happens is uh, i get five ranks so uh, so now you you see like there are five rows so these are like the five ranks that i get and i have two ranks because i get for subject and object so this is something uh, was uh, that was mentioned earlier so you are corrupting the subject side with all negatives and you are corrupting object side with all negatives and then you get ranks for each sides so these are the ranks that i get now for these five triples right so uh, to get the general uh, you know like uh, idea about the performance of the model we need to aggregate these ranks and there are different metrics available like the mean rank so which just takes the mean of these uh, ranks and then it returns a single value that's 260 so now as you see here like uh, three of the triples it was performing quite well and two it was not well right so uh, but when you see this single uh, rank like mr of 260 you may think that the model is not performing well because the rank is quite high right but that is also because this last triple is actually dragging the rank uh, further below like if you had averaged only like the top 3 or the top uh, like these four ranks uh, you would have got a good mean rank but the last one is dragging it below so mean rank is prone to outliers so that's why we have something called mrr like the mean reciprocal rank so the mean reciprocal rank what it does is it just takes reciprocals of the ranks and then uh, averages it so uh, ampligraph provides uh, uh, an api uh, for this as well like you can uh, so under ampligraph.evaluation you have mrr score where you pass the ranks and it returns the mrr score again this is a value between 0 and 1 and closer it is to 1 that means uh, better the model so now uh, what does this indicate now so if you see your i'll take the reciprocal of the mrr and what you get is the mean rank after removing the outlier effect so you are removing the outlier effect from that and you see like the mean rank is close to 3 so it's like a fair uh, you know uh, rank that is assigned because you are removing the outlier effect that was uh, you know due to the last triple that we had in our test set and then uh, we have another metric called hit set n so this is uh, uh, a metric which tells you like how many ranks that we had earlier are having a rank less than or equal to n so uh, so let's say uh, so ampligraph provides an api called hit set n score where you pass the ranks and the n so when i say hit set ranks uh, hit set n score with n equal to 1 that means i am saying give me all the uh, like percentage of the ranks which were equal to 1 and when i say uh, uh, 10 it means give me uh, uh, the percentage of ranks which are less than or equal to 10 so when i run this i i, I see that 30% of that uh, is equal to 1 and 70% of the ranks above uh, were less than or equal to 10 so if i scroll back you'll see like three of them were 1 and seven of them were uh, less than 10 so this this metric can be used to see how the model ranks in general so uh, so another th another thing to uh, add here is that like per triple that we had in our test set so we had like five triples so for each triple the number of synthetic negatives that we generated for ranking was 14000 because in our data set we had 14000 unique entities so uh, using model dot n to idx so this is a dictionary which is which maps entity names to indices uh, so i won't get into the details of this but uh, when you take the length of this you will get the number of unique entities we have in our knowledge graph so so these many corruptions were generated so now i talked about all these metrics now so now how to uh, look at these metrics values so uh, so when i say mrr is uh, some value like say 0.01 is it a good model or a bad model so i said like closer it is to one it's good but again uh, the further it is it's very difficult to determine like how good the model is it's not very straightforward like 0.01 may be a good model it depends on how many corruptions you are using per triple so uh, in the case of uh, let's say uh, let's say you had like only a thousand corruptions 
and your MRR score is uh, 0.01. That means on an average, after removing the outlier effect, your uh, average rank is close to 100. So that means per triple when you generated 1000 corruptions, your model was able to rank your true positive at around 100th position. So you had like 100 negatives above it, right? So uh, since the number of corruptions are small, like 1000 is a small number of corruptions. So this value is a bad value. So your model is not doing good on your data set. But let's say you had millions of corruptions. So in that case, uh, it would have been a good value, like MRR of uh, 0 0.01. So that means out of a million corruptions, only 100, were, 100 corruptions were ranked on top of your true positive. So that way, your model did quite well at uh, you know, like ranking your true positive. So ideally, I would go for hit set n value. Uh, uh, so because this can give a fair idea, like when I say give me uh, hit set 100 on the test set, if a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, percentage of your test set triples are having rank less than or equal to uh, n, uh, you know, that gives me a fair value, uh, like fair idea of how good the model is. So the choice of n should depend on number of corruptions. So ideally, I'd say like top one percent of corruption. So, uh, so in this case, if it I choose like n equal to around one fifty or something like that, because we have like uh, fourteen thousand corruptions. So this is usually how I I would go, uh, you know, while running these kind of data sets. So uh, let's just create a. Uh, function which will just print out the aggregate metrics like the MR, MRR, and hit set n score, uh, which we'll use later, like when we are uh, moving on further in the tutorial. Similarly, you have like uh, uh, like any other machine learning task. While training a model, uh, you know you you don't want to underfit and overfit on the data, and uh, you you especially don't want to overfit on your test set. So you need a validation set and so on. So and uh, so that is where you can use like early stopping. So uh, we provide uh, uh, like a support for early stopping where you can pass in early stopping parameters and then the model would uh, early stop based on the criteria that's specified. But early stopping takes a lot of time to run. So for this tutorial, uh, like I won't run this cell. But if you want, you can play around with this later. So uh, once you do early stopping, you would have the best model uh, like uh, uh, that is fit on your test set, uh, sorry, validation set. And then you can evaluate it. So to summarize uh, whatever we have done so uh, until now, uh, so what we did was uh, we had our data set of triples that we uh, split into train test and validation set using train test split no unseen API. And this was done to make sure we don't have unseen entities in the test and validation set. And then we trained a model that's uh, trans C. Uh, so uh, with all the hyperparameters that I mentioned earlier, so I use model.fit to fit it. And then we can save the model and restore the model uh, using these APIs. And once we have the model trained, so it's running now, we can uh, perform evaluation on the test set. So using the ranking protocol that was mentioned earlier, so, so evaluate performance API helps you to do this. So you pass the test set, you pass the model along with the uh, true positives that are there in your knowledge graphs, and you get a filtered rank. So that's like you generate corruptions per triple, you filter out the uh, true positives and so on. Uh, and then you get the ranks. And then you can compute the aggregate metrics on that. Right. So, uh, so let's just break for a Q and A session. Uh, so, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. So, are there any questions, Luca? Like, we're taking questions on the on the chat. Okay, as we speak. Okay, then uh, shall I move further? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so now coming back to. Uh, like the practical way of evaluating it. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, like uh, in the uh, ranking protocol, usually what we do is we use all the uh, entities that are there in our data set to uh, 
to compute the to to generate the negatives right during evaluation so so let's let's consider this test set now and i'll i'll tell you what i mean by it so let's say i have a test set which has only these many triples so uh so you have tropic thunder the language of the film is chinese you have like some other film whose language is english and so on so so what i want to do is uh, I, i have selected a test set with only uh, one particular relation that's language and i want to find out the language of, of the film so this movie uh, which language does it uh, like is it made in so this is what i want to find out so let's say this is my test set so uh, if we use the standard evaluation protocol what happens is uh, when i run this what happens is per triple that we had in our uh, test set it will generate all the corruptions like uh, all the corruptions as in uh, we had 14000 entities in our data set right what we saw earlier so it will corrupt the tropic like uh, tropic thunder it will replace tropic thunder with all 14000 it will replace standard chinese with all 14000 uh, entities and then it will rank score that and then it will try to rank the true positive triple against all the corruptions and that's how it's done for each and every triple right and you see that you get a mrr score of uh, uh, around 0.22 right so uh, so you can see like we have like uh, 10 triples in our test set and you get rank of size 10,2 so per triple you get two ranks that subject side corruption and object side corruption right so uh, sometimes we may not want to do this like in this case i want to corrupt only the language side because i want to find out the language of this film right so uh, ampligraph provides a way to do this and the way it's done is you can use corrupt side argument and you can specify which side to corrupt by default it uses s comma o like it corrupts subject and object and it returns two ranks but if i just say corrupt only object side what happens is it will corrupt uh object side with all the entities that we had in our data set that's like 14000 entities and then you can see like uh uh you get rank of size 10 comma that means like it's only there's only one dimension to it so uh, earlier you had 10 comma 2 but now you have 10 comma that means it corrupted only one side and it returned 10 ranks right and you can also see like earlier the mrr was around 0.2 something uh 0.22 and now the mrr improved that's because you are making the task slightly easier for the model because you are ranking against only like on one side and you are like asking the model uh to evaluate on it so uh that's one way to do it and this is also needed when you have millions of corruptions so it wouldn't be like uh, it would it would take a lot of time to uh you know uh, corrupt both subject and objects it will take twice the time so uh, so it's faster this way and practically when you are looking at uh, industrial size data sets this is one way of evaluating the other way is uh, evaluating against a subset of entities so as i said earlier we had used all the entities so that's like 14000 entities that we had to generate the corruptions during evaluation right but now if you look at uh, the task that we are doing we only need to evaluate against the languages uh, that are present in our data set because the task is to find out the language of the film right so you are now making the task a little bit easier for the model by by giving only the languages so instead of 14000 corruptions per triple uh, what we do is we replace uh, now we compute corruptions only with 61 triples so when i run this cell i get unique languages in our uh, training set and now i'll pass uh, this argument called entity subset to evaluate performance uh, and i'll pass this uh, uh, list of uh, unique languages and you can see now what happens is it will compute the ranks by corrupting the object side but not using all the entities but only 61 entities so uh, this becomes extremely fast especially if you look at like industrial size data set with millions of entities so uh, so this is a practical way of evaluating it you choose semantically valid corruptions so uh, when you when you have a set of hypotheses 
you'd choose semantically valid corruptions and then you would use the ranking protocol and that way it becomes not just an e easier task for the model but also uh like a semantically valid task and also a faster task so next uh, let's look at uh, uh let's compare a few models and let's uh, see uh like how these models differ so uh, this is again from uh, not from the scoring function perspective but from you know like the parameters that we uh, pass to the model so let's say i train a transi model with k equal to 150 uh, and uh, like some other parameters like for 50 epochs with eta equal to 1 and some other laws you know uh, so now what happens is uh it trains on this and then you'll see let it run and yeah so you have the mrr so transi is uh like performing like is giving an mrr of 0.13 on our training set uh, on our test set like after fitting on our training set so now if you see here in this data set we had 14000 uh entities and 237 relations now if i run this thing uh, this cell so what i'm doing here is i am uh, so ent underscore emb so this is the entity embedding matrix that is learned and this is the relational embedding matrix that's learned so when i specified k equal to 150 here so uh, so what happened was internally transi model so that learned a matrix so for each individual entity that we had and each uh, relation that we had it learned a vector of size 150 so that's why you have 14000 odd uh, uh, you know like entries in this each of dimension 150 and uh, for relations you have 220 uh, 237, 150 so this is the size of the embedding matrix similarly if you run this this cell I, i'm not going to run it because we have less time but uh, if you run this you would also see like this mult when you specify k equal to 150 it will also give out an embedding matrix of the same size right but now let's look at complex so when i run complex what happens is it trains on uh, you know like so it's all the parameters are the same uh, as earlier the only thing is the model is different so it's complex and it's doing the same thing like it's training on it and evaluating on the test set so once uh, the this thing is once it strained let me print out uh the size of the embedding matrix so it's still running and now it's evaluating on the test set so uh so now you would see like the model performs slightly better than transi like it's 0.24 mrr and you see now uh, there's a small difference here in the size of embedding matrix so we we had specified k equal to 150 and with transi we got embedding matrix of the same size like for uh, for each entity it it had a vector of size 150 but in in case of complex it changed to 300 so the reason for this is because uh, complex uses two parts one is the real part and the imaginary part because it works in complex spaces so if you see uh, uh, the number of trainable parameters now is twice than that of what is of uh, transi similarly dismult also so dismult also uses uh, the exact k that we specify but complex double set so uh, so number of trainable parameters are more and that is why training time is also more right uh, so the next uh, so in the next section let's look at uh, convolutional models so you have two types like concav and conv so the difference between uh, the three models that we saw earlier uh, transi dismult and complex and convolutional models is that the way in which they look at the inputs so uh, the conv uh, and uh, so conv and concav converts the image to image like representation uh, converts the embeddings to image like representations and then it uh, uh, feeds to the uh, like that is the input to it whereas uh, for con uh, for transi dismult and uh, complex the inputs are vectors 
so uh, conventional models converts it to images like images as in like it just reshapes the embeddings to uh, 2d structure and then performs convolutions on it so i'm not going to run the con kb because again uh, it takes time you can run it and you can check later uh, but, so let me just run con v so con v is uh, you know like if you look at the leadership board on these uh, traditional uh, data sets that we have on the benchmark data sets con v performs the best so it's the topmost there uh, but the problem with con v is that uh, since it does convolutions on top of the embeddings it's extremely slow so uh, if you saw earlier like the other models took around uh, 20 odd seconds uh, for uh, 50 epochs but uh, con v just for two epochs it's taking around 20 seconds so as you can see uh, these models don't scale well so uh, if you are having industrial size data sets con con v and con kb might not be a good option for you uh, if you are having smaller data sets then maybe you can choose con v but when you go for larger data sets you have to choose between like the traditional models that are there not the convolutional ones so uh, again if i run this cell it will just print out the size of the embedding matrix which is again the same like whatever k you specify you get the same size but only on uh, the main reason for it being to be slow is because of the convolutions so now let's quickly move to uh, the next section which is related to selecting the hyperparameters uh, so choosing hyperparameters can be a tricky task like for example let's say i run transi with k equal to 1000 what will happen is it will learn so for each unique entity that you have in your data set it learns a vector of size 1000 So now thousand could be extremely big if you have like uh, millions of entities. So one problem could be uh, your embedding matrix might not even fit on your GPU. So choosing a large K, so that is a drawback. So it may not fit on the GPU. Second thing is uh, the storage space on the disk would also be a lot more. So for uh, because you know while saving it, it will take a lot of space because of the larger K. So you see now when I ran this model on the test set, it gave a performance uh, of around uh, 0.15 MRR of around 0.15. So now let's train another model with a very small k, like k equal to 10. So now what would happen is it might underfit on this data because your k is very small. Number of trainable parameters are extremely small, right? So I'm training for same number of epochs, same number, same parameters, just the k is different. And you see like Uh, the performance uh, decreased from 0.15 it decreased to 0.12 uh, 13 so there is a slight performance decrease and uh, here i'm just running for 20 epochs but if you run it for longer you would see k equal to 1000 would generate very good uh, performance whereas this would not be uh, good so ideally how to choose this k so you uh, you know what you do is uh, so if i am training a model what i'd do is i'd use a combination of k and eta so earlier i had k equal to 10 and eta equal to 1 whereas prior to that i had k equal to 1000 and eta equal to 1 so this eta parameter also plays a significant role so by balancing k and eta we can like get uh, almost the same performance as having a large k so uh, so here i'm running the same model uh, just the difference is k and eta so i'm i'm having a larger eta that means per positive i'm generating 20 negatives and uh, uh and i'm having embedding size of k equal to 250 so when i do this uh, what happens is uh, uh it it takes slightly more time to train because the number of corruptions that are generated is now higher so that's why it's uh, time wise it's more uh, you know like it's longer uh but performance wise you would see like the performance now is quite good so you can see like the mrr score is similar to what it was with k equal to 1000 so now you can see the difference now so ideally you would balance between k and eta similarly you can play around with other hyperparameters like regularizers so here i'm using uh, l3 regularizer you can choose l2 by changing p equal to 2 and so on uh, and this are uh, this is the regularizer weight 
Similarly, you can change optimizers, batch counts, initializers, and losses. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, you can play around with this later. Uh, so now, until now, we have been individually running these models. But AmpliGraph provides uh, an API called Select Best Model Ranking under AmpliGraph.Evaluation uh, module, which can be used to uh, do a hyperparameter search. So you can specify like a, a grid like this. So whatever parameters you saw earlier uh, in the model, like k, epoch, initializer, and all these things, so they are specified as a grid here. So in this grid, I specify all the lists of values that I want to try out. So in this case, I just want to try out one batch count, but multiple values of k, multiple values of eta, and so on. And this list can be extremely large. Also, you can also specify callables here. So instead of a single value like this, you can specify a callable, like uh, that's a function, you know, which generates values uh, dynamically. So, uh, so what select best model ranking does is it will run through all the grid combinations and it will spit out the best model. So you'll get the best model along with its parameter, and you'll also get the experimental history of all the models that have been tried out, right? Uh, and when you use callables like this, you can have infinite values generated. So how to limit it? So that's where maximum combination comes in. So you can say, uh, run this only for you know like two combinations or hundred combinations. Then it will choose like randomly uh, hundred combinations from the grid, and then it will run on those hundred combinations, and which you can uh, look at like in the experimental history, all the combinations that are tried. I'm not going to run this again because hyperparameter search takes a lot of time, but you can play around with this. So uh, coming to uh, the next section, that's the calibration. So this is, again, a section that Luca had talked about earlier. So you can use, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, like we saw the scores of Transy model. So the scores were, uh, like the score for that triple was around minus 8 or something. So the, the scores can be between plus infinity and minus infinity, depending on the type of the model. So now, uh, see, again, for this triple, these two triples, you see that the scores are negative, right? So now, how can we threshold the score to a value between 0 and 1? So this is where calibrate comes in. So uh, so you can use uh, model.calibrate. Ampligraph provides a... Uh, uh, this uh, API called Calibrate, which can be used to uh, calibrate the model and return a score uh, between 0 and 1. So once you, once the model is calibrated, you can use predict proba so to, uh, to, to give the probability estimate of, on the triples. So now I'm calibrating uh, for 100 epochs. So, so OK, the way to calibrate is you need to have negatives. So you specify the positives, you specify the negatives, and then you calibrate. But let's say you don't have negatives. Then what you what you can do is you can use synthetic corruptions like earlier. And uh, But when you do so, you need to choose this hyperparameter called positive base rate, which is, again, a domain-dependent uh, parameter, which you have to choose wisely. So this, is, this basically specifies what percentage of your test set triples uh, can be true. So this is something that you have to look at your domain and you have to think about uh, how much of your test set or your hypothesis that you are testing can be true. And then you have to pass this. Uh, so if you want to know more about Calibrate, so there's a paper reference here. So this is a paper by Luca and Pedro. Uh, so you can look at this uh, in detail later. So that details on how this Calibrate API works and how to choose positive base rate. So uh, so this is all from my section. Uh, so I'll hand over to Nick, who would uh, walk, walk you through uh, through some of the downstream tasks on knowledge discovery and uh, uh, you know um, uh, the other stuff. So over to you, Nick. Okay, thank you, Sumit. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so let me know when. Uh, you can see it, please. Uh, and is this visible? 
Not yet. Hmm. Anything else? Maybe uh, try refreshing, uh, you know, like uh, underline.io and, you know, join again. Yep. Okay, in the meanwhile, I just remind everybody that we're taking your questions in the in the chat here. So um, if you if you have things to ask, just just ask away. You're back. Okay, let's come through there, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Uh, as Sumit mentioned, it's going to take you through uh, a number of downstream tasks. Um, the main one of this is going to be just in the area of knowledge discovery. Uh, so in Appograph, uh, we have a number of high-level convenience functions uh, that we can use to perform uh, knowledge discovery using graph embeddings. Uh, these functions are uh, query top end, discover facts, find clusters, and find duplicates. Uh, the query top end function is is essentially when you're given two elements of a triple um, and you want to return all the possible completions of um, of that entity given the embeddings uh, that you've trained. Uh, discover facts is again a bit more high level, so it's it's you want to generate a set of candidate statements um, which are generated using some some defined strategies just to pair down the number of possibilities. Uh, and return triples that perform well when evaluated against corruptions. Um, and so this is kind of a, um, a graph completion kind of task. If, if, if you suspect that you have facts in your knowledge graph that, um, uh, that aren't uh, there. Um, and then we also include find clusters, which, has, uh, which will perform link-based cluster analysis on graph embeddings. Uh, there, there is a, a function find duplicates. Uh, which will try and find um, and dis disambiguate entities in a graph based with embeddings, uh, although I won't be covering that one here. So the first uh, example is triple completion. As I mentioned, um, sometimes you might have a triple uh, and you have either a, a relation or one entity, so either the head or the tail pair of it, uh, and you want to see what are the most likely completions of that triple. Uh, so here are shown the three kind of instances we're considering. We have the head and relation, and we just want to know what, what's the tail entity. Uh, or we have the head and the tail, and we know, want to know what are the, the possible relations that connect these two. Um, or we're just missing the head entity. Um, if we have particular sets of relations that we want to consider, or specific entities, um, we can also provide them uh, to the function by specifying rels to consider or ends to consider. Um, so I'm just going to run this cell now. Um, so just to save time, I'm just going to restore the transient model that we used previously. Uh, and here, we're providing to the query top end function the model. Uh, top end is the number of um, triples returned we want uh, that, that are potentially true. Uh, and for the, the head and relation, we're going to use uh, Missy Elliott uh, and people person profession relation. Um, so you can see that the results returned from the model here are uh, Ms. Elliott is a pianist, a songwriter, uh, a record producer, a musician. Um, if, if you know who Missy Elliott is, these are all truish to a degree. I'm not sure how good she is on the piano per se, um, but they're, they're all essentially kind of art, artistic uh, musician um, entities. Uh, you, could, you could then judge based on the score um, or, or using the, the model calibration whether these scores are more likely than um, many of the other uh, triples. Uh, and just to give you an, an instance of completing the relation, uh, we have here the movie The Departed. Uh, and unfortunately, this is one of the examples uh, where the freebase mapping didn't work. But this is the production company that was involved in the creation of it. Um, and you can see that the relations we returned are all um, essentially in, uh, ooh, I'm now getting different results than I was in the setup. Uh, okay, well, I did vet these before, and they were given all of the um, film industry-related relations between these two. 
The next task we're going to look at is downstream clustering. So once you've trained the model, um, you could use the embeddings to uh, in a clustering or a classification setup. Um, and so here just we're going to illustrate how to do node clustering. Uh, so we do have an API find clusters, which receives the model, uh, the concepts cluster, and, and the clustering model. Uh, and then we'll just form clustering on the entity embeddings themselves and return um, the, 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 the indices. Um, so I'm going to run this cell here. Uh, we're just going to run k-means using three clusters on all of the entities in our trained model. Um, and then once we've generated them, I'm just going to plot them um, in, in the notebook here using a uh, well, PCI on them, PCA on them, um, and, and plot them with uh, matplotlib. Um, And okay, some issue with the library there. Um, but we essentially have the clusters determined from the embeddings um, and plotted. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to, to come up with your own applications um, for this. Uh, and again, the, the same uh, logic and basic flow will, will work if you're trying to apply a classification model, for example. Um, the third section we're going to consider here is hypothesis generation. So as I said before, um, there are instances where you might have a knowledge graph and you know that you have uh, undiscovered facts in it or just that there are missing relations from it. Um, so we provide this API to um, use a trained model to try and identify what facts are missing from it. Um, I'm actually, I'm gonna run the cell before explaining this just because it, it takes a little bit of time. Um, so in a knowledge graph, the, uh, the number of potential facts are huge uh, and evaluating all of them individually can take a very long time. So uh, in order to avoid having to evaluate all of them, uh, we have implemented a number of different strategies uh, which will kind of sample from the space of possible facts. Um, so these include entity frequency, where we, we simply take how frequent each entity is in the graph and use that as our sampling weight. Um, we also then have kind of graph metric approaches, look, looking at graph degree, uh, cluster coefficient, um, and metrics looking at kind of local graph structures like cluster triangles and cluster squares. Um, random uniform will simply take a random set of facts um, or a random combination of entities and relations. Uh, and exhaustive will, um, as I said, run through all possible uh, entity relation combinations. Um, but I do not recommend using that unless you want to wait several weeks for it to run. Um, so probably not appropriate for a collab notebook. Um, when we apply these strategies, uh, as I said, we sample from, from a, depending on each metric used to sort the entities. Um, these are generally sorted in ascending fashion. Uh, so it, we would start with the, the lowest frequency entity if we were using the, the entity frequency um, strategy. Uh, and this is just on the assumption that frequently um, or, or densely connected nodes are, are less likely to have missing true statements. Uh, this has been generally true in our empirical uh, evaluations, um, but that might depend on uh, the graph data that you're working with. The general procedure in how this works is we first generate a set of candidate statements and then we rank them against a set of corruptions using the, the built-in Ampligraph Evaluate Performance function. Uh, this is under the hood, those that you don't want to concern yourself with this from here. Um, and then each of those candidate statements are then evaluated to obtain a rank um, and triples that appear within a, a user-defined top-end level are, are returned as potentially true statements. Uh, so again, um, this is an example uh, of the function. We're going to use the entire data set uh, as our space of possible facts to generate from. We provide the model that we've previously trained, um, and we're going to select top n 500. So this is um, this is actually different from the top n uh, parameter defined in the query top n function, um, which maybe is due to a uh, um, 
to be rewritten actually uh, just for clarity. Uh, but essentially this top end will say that if your uh, fact occurs within the, um, the within the between ranks 500 and zero, then we can consider it true. Uh, the max candidate uh, parameter uh, is simply the number of candidates to generate. Uh, if you're running this in a collab notebook, I recommend not um, setting this too high as it's quite easy to just crash the session. Uh, the strategy we're gonna use is cluster triangles. Uh, and we're gonna specify a target relation again of people, person, profession, um, so that we only consider uh, potential facts using this relation. Uh, so we run the model, uh, and again, slightly different results than the ones in the preset, um, but generally the same ones. So here we have Bob Clampett uh, predicting uh, is an actor, Bob Boyle is an actor, Thomas Newman is an actor. Um, so I, I, I did actually check who these people were. Uh, they're not necessarily actors. Um, but they do work in movie industry, so as, as directors and animators. Um, but again, depending on the graph, you'll get better or different results, um, or, or how long and how many candidate statements you want to generate. Uh, the final uh, function I want to show is just how, um, it's just a, a very, very simple convenience function for generating tensor board visu uh, visualizations. Uh, so this is just a very good way of um, getting an understanding of, of the space of the embeddings. Um, so again, we have a simple function called create <coughs> tensor board visualizations. Uh, we supply it with the model uh, and it will generate all the files required to run tensor board. Um, again, if you're running this from Colab, the, 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 the following cell won't work, uh, but I'm gonna switch over to a different tab where I have the example already running. Um, so if, you, if you're not familiar with TensorBoard, this is how it can, um, this TensorBoard projector, so you want to select projector in the top right, um, and you can use that to visualize uh, a set of embeddings. So here we have uh, Ernest Hemingway, and it's showing the, the nearest entities in the embedding space. Um, we find designated hitter, uh, which I guess is the baseball term. Um, it's giving us all the other you know, similar positions in baseball. Uh, and cock the movie, I guess. Um, but I'll, I'll leave you here um, and hand over to Luca uh, to wrap up towards the session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you for the overview, Nick, Nick and Sumit. Um, we are uh, approaching well the end of the tutorial. That was actually uh, the last part. So again, I I would like to I would like to thank you all from the from the audience and the the other organizers of the tutorial. Thanks for uh, for all the work that you put into this, and thanks for uh, for attending. Now we have a couple of minutes before uh, before the end of the session. So. I'd say if some of you has uh, other questions, we can we can activate the live audio feed, and you can take you can take the stage. You you know how it works. You just have to click on raise hand, and we'll we'll let you in. So please be our guest. Ask, just just ask away. I think there is a question uh, uh, by Gancham, like asking, uh, do we support images and te text, uh, and how can it be used in uh, knowledge graph embeddings? Maybe Luca would answer, like to answer that. Yeah, I can take that. Thanks, thanks, Sumit. Uh, well, um, again, um, I, I start with the second question. Ampligraph does not support that yet. We we have that uh, kind of features in, in the pipeline in a roadmap but we we don't we don't support that yet um, there are there are some models that that support multi-model knowledge graphs as you as you saw from the from the overview of theory earlier on 
the reason why why it's it's interesting to look at those multimodal attributes, numbers, strings, even images, why not? Is that in the rational is that if you find a way to embed also those literals, also those numbers or those uh, strings of text, you will inject additional information into the link prediction pipeline. Therefore, hopefully, training your model on top of more knowledge, therefore coming to better results. That's the, the end game. The, the ultimate goal is to achieve better predictive power when predicting things, right? Does it, does it answer? I, I hope that, that answers your, your questions. And again, there are, there are a number of uh, methods in literature. Um, once we will share the slides, you can go back in the, in the presentation and, and, and look it up. Adriana posted the link for the tutorial. And thank you, Adriana. She just uploaded and the link to the hands-on collab tutorial. Um, besides, you'll find more, more tutorials on the uh, Ampligraph documentation webpage. There is a list of um, collab notebooks, Jupyter notebooks, code snippets that you can take a look at, play around with. And if you want to look at further details, you can open the API documentation every function is uh, comes with a code snippet that you can copy paste in your Python interpreter in your script and, and run to see what, what happens. Um, by the way, um, this has probably been told uh, by, by Sumit or Nick, uh, Ampligraph supports um, GPU and, and but, but architectures, but if you don't have a GPU, it runs on a traditional CPU. Um, architecture as well so just feel free to play around with it it's just a bit a bit slower that's it um do we have other questions it's a bit hard to read through these messages um again and if somebody wants to ask a, a question live uh, you can raise your hand we'll we'll give you uh, audio oh, over. We go. We have one. We have Claudia here. Hello, Claudia. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hello. actually. Hello. Do you? Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, great. So I don't have a question. Uh, I would just like to uh, to thank you all uh, in a live way uh, for the excellent uh, tutorial. It was really. Uh, a tutorial from theory uh, to practice, as in the title, and very comprehensive, very well done. So thank you for all the hard work and for, for uh, the details that you provided for every for covering uh, uh, every aspect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, so, you much. so much. Glad you appreciate it. And well, um, Thanks, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, this is, uh, we all wished we could be in Santiago uh, for obvious reasons, but again, uh, thanks thanks to, to, to the chairs and, and everybody involved in the organization. This must have been not an easy one to organize given, given the, the setting. So um, everything worked out pretty well in the end. So thanks. All right, so time to wrap up. Um, I will again thank you all for attending. And again, if you have further questions, there is a link in the chat um, to a Slack channel where we can take further questions after the tutorial is over. So feel free to just drop in. Um, I saw some of you already did um, ask questions on, on the code base or uh, in general on the theory. There's pretty much always somebody on the team online that, that, that can give you a bit of feedback and a bit of a bit of help should you need some. All right, and with that, thank you so much, and I I I, I will uh, uh, sorry a bit of echo. Um, I will see you around uh, hopefully next time in in person. Bye. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye. 
Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.